Join us on the Group W bench. Okay, it's 6.30. We're going to get started now that we, we have our, uh, our quorum. Good evening. This is Steve Lionel, Vice Chair of the City of Nashua Zoning Board. Recording in progress. I'll start over. Okay, recording in progress. This is Steve Lionel, Vice Chair of the City of Nashua Zoning Board of Adjustment. And this is the July 26th, 2022 Zoning Board meeting. I'm filling in for Mary Ellen McKay, Chair, who cannot be with us tonight. This evening's meeting will be conducted in a hybrid format. The meeting is accessible in person in the third floor auditorium of Nashua City Hall, 229 Main Street, and via Zoom at the link posted in all public meeting agendas. Attendance via telephone is available using the Zoom connection details. Minutes of tonight's meeting, as well as audio and video recordings, will be available later at nashuanh.gov slash agenda center. Select Zoning Board of Adjustment. If anyone has a problem accessing the meeting, please call 603-821-2049 and they will help you connect. In the event that the public is unable to access the meeting via the methods mentioned above, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. The chair is in control of the meeting. To the extent practicable and advisable, the board will follow the procedures as identified in its bylaws. The applicant will present their case for 15 minutes, followed by questions by the board. Next, persons wishing to speak in favor or with questions or opposition will be asked to speak for up to five minutes each. If there are questions or opposition, the applicant will have five minutes to present a response. Finally, one and only one person with questions or in opposition will be permitted to speak again before the board deliberates and determines an outcome. City staff will monitor a timer visible on the room monitors. The chair will notify speakers as time is expiring. If you are participating by Zoom and wish to speak when public input is requested, please use the raise hand option, which can be found under reactions on a computer or the more menu on a phone. The chair will call you in turn. Please use the lower hand option when done. Also, please mute your microphone until called to speak. Note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call. Tonight, we will be hearing requests for deviation from the Nashua Zoning Code in the form of applications for special exceptions and variances. A special exception is a request that seeks permission to do something that the zoning ordinance permits only under special circumstances. To grant a special exception, five points of law are required to be met. These are outlined in the application and will be summarized in board motions. A variance is a request that seeks permission to do something that ordinance does not permit. Variances also have five points of law to be met, different from those for special exceptions. Per the City of Nashua bylaws and State of New Hampshire revised statutes, a minimum of three or more affirmative votes are required to approve any motion. The board will hear all scheduled cases if a quorum of three voting board members is present at this meeting, and we do have a quorum tonight. Any citizen has the right to contest the decision that this board makes. Should we make a decision that you believe is an error, you have the right to request a rehearing. A written rehearing request must be received by the City of Nashua Planning Department within 30 calendar days from the date of decision. Should this board not grant a rehearing request, you can file an appeal directly to New Hampshire Superior Court. Please contact Mr. Falk of the Planning Department for more information. So for this meeting, we have the following full board, board members in attendance. We have uh, myself, Steve Lionel, I'm vice chair. Uh, online, we have Mr. Jack Currier, who serves as clerk. And here in the room, we have Mr. J.P. Boucher. We also have the following alternate board member in attendance, Mr. Jay Mancara. Uh, in addition to board members, we have with us Mr. Carter Falk, Deputy Planning Manager, Ms. Kate Poirier, Zoning Coordinator, and is Matt, Sul Matt, Sul Mr. Matt Sullivan is not here. Okay. So let us start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. For board members participating by Zoom, please also state whether there is anyone in the room with you which is required under the right to know law and state your reason for not attending in person. 
Okay, J.P. Boucher. Present. Jay Mancara. Present. Jack Courier. Present on Zoom. I'm uh, away from Nashville on a pre-planned trip. Okay, and uh, I'm Steve Lionel. I am present. Uh, since we have uh, four members in attendance, including alternate Jay Mancara, uh, all four uh, members will be voting on each case, unless uh, somebody chooses to recuse themselves. Uh, Mr. Falk, are there any changes to the agenda? <clears throat> yes, Mr. Chair. The case for 45 Langholm Drive will be tabled to the August 9th meeting. And the case for 7 Meredith Drive will be tabled to the August 23rd meeting. It will not be heard tonight. Thank you. Okay, I will now read the first case into the record, which is actually case number three on the agenda. The owner is 7 Coliseum Avenue Limited Partnership, address 7 Coliseum Avenue, sheet E, lot 260, requesting variance from land use code section 190-42 Table 42-2 for minimum dwelling units per acre, 12 units per acre, 48 units permitted, 141 units existing, 173 units proposed to construct an attached five-story, 32-unit addition. This is in the GB zone, Ward 1. And I see uh, Attorney Prunier is here to present the case, so the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. For the record, my name is Gerald Prunier. I'm an attorney in Nashville, New Hampshire, with offices at 20 Trafalgar Square. This evening, I have with me William Walker, who is a representative of the applicant, as well as Jeff Cavan, our engineer. Um, this site, as indicated in the notice, is located at 7 Coliseum Avenue, and it's on approximately 4.1 acres in that area. It is in the GB district. Um, we were here before you in 2012, uh, but we were here for a special exception. Since that period of time, the LE ordinance has changed and it's been taken out of that district. So this evening we're here before you for a variance, but it's the same location in the same area that we've, we were back here in 2012. Um, what we are here for you for this evening is that uh, we presently have a building on this site that has 141 units for seniors. We're proposing to add 32 units in the rear of the building as shown on the plan. Uh, so we would have a total of 173 units. We're adding parking spaces, uh, 32 of them. There is already existing 106, which so would make it 138 spaces. Um, it could be said that probably about two thirds of the residents don't have a car in, in that particular area. So we don't need as the number of parking spaces for one for one for the units. These units are apartments. They have their own kitchen and bedroom, and um, they've been, the area is well taken care of. Uh, I'll give you an example of um, one of the reasons we're here for before you this evening is um, there are two age limits. One is 55, another one is 62. The waiting list to get into this thing into our units is 70 years, uh, excuse me, seven years in one instance and 10 years waiting list in another. So we have long waiting lists to uh, the people who want to get into these particular units. Um, the location is one of the reasons as well. Uh, we have uh, a, 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 a bus stop right in front of the units that, uh, as you well know, the bus you can pick up and be, go throughout the city of Nashua. Uh, the other is that we have um, things that people are, are interested in, such as doctors, banks, restaurants, uh, grocery store, 
movie theater, all in that particular area. So the elderly uh, have almost all the services that they need in that particular area. It is one of the greater locations of the, in the city of Nasher, and I don't know why, uh, since most of these type of units, uh, services, are in a general business district, that they took the senior elderly out of the general business. It's something that the city of Nashville should look into again. Um, as it indica indicated, this is independent housing. Uh, they're more like a, apartments. Uh, people live there, take care of themselves, and uh, enjoy the area that they, they have. Um, we have some property available that we want to use, as indicated in the rear of the building, that will allow us to add the 32 units on the five stories to match the architecture that exists presently. Uh, it will allow the owner to use a re make a reasonable use of the property, and as indicated in the waiting list, the number of waiting lists, there's a need for it in Nashua of, uh, of housing. We, we can definitely show that there is this type of need and we can provide it. Um, I'm, you're all pretty familiar with it. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we would be glad to answer them. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Mr. Mancara. If I could ask Attorney Prinier, um, are is there any level of services that are provided for residents on the site, whether that's transportation, are there common facilities such as gym facilities or dining facilities on the site? I'm sure there may be some, but let me just ask our, uh, 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 Mr. Walker if he is, could come up and... Um, Speak to you regarding that since he's yep. most familiar. Yep. Please give your name and address for the record. Oops. Yep, that's for, fine. For the record, my name's William Walker. Um, my uh, company address is 264 U.S. Route 1 in Scarborough, Maine. Um, and we're associated as the applicant with Seven Call CMF. Um, yes, in on the property, we do have common area facilities. Um, we have a facility uh, in the common area that we use for potlucks for the residents. Uh, we do have a small area that uh, they use for uh, working out with uh, some equipment, such as uh, bicycles and those types of things. Uh, they have some people that come in and do classes like yoga. Um, we have a common space that's a media room uh, that people can go for movie night and watch movies. Um, there's laundry facilities. Uh, there's a laundry facility on each floor in the building so that they have the ability to do that. Uh, as far as health care or home care type services, some of the residents do contract with a third party uh, that comes in to assist them with uh, any of their homemaking needs or health care needs uh, there at the facility. Does that? May I follow up? Are the... Um facilities that you, that you do have, the common facilities are on the site size to accommodate the additional units? Yes, they will be uh, capable of handling those additional units. We had an originally, uh, when the building was built uh, in 79, there was a small common area. And then when we added on to it in 2012, we expanded that and there's room to accommodate for the additional people um, in that area for public events. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further questions from the board? I see Mr. Courier has his hand up, okay. Uh, my, my question is, is the proposed new unit gonna be connected internally uh, to the existing unit? Yes, they are. Yeah. Okay, yes. thank you. Any further questions from the board? Not seeing any. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Have a seat. Is there anybody in the room who wishes to speak in favor of this application? Okay. 
Is there anybody on Zoom who wishes to speak in favor of the application? Please use the raise hand feature if, if you do. Okay, not seeing anybody. Is there anybody in the room with questions, concerns, or opposition to the application? Okay. All right, let's see. I saw the woman in the flowered uh, dress first. Raise her hand, so please step up to the microphone and give your name and address for the record. Good evening. Um, my name is Nancy Miller. I'm a resident at Coliseum, the older building, the original building. I've lived there for seven years, so it'll be seven years in November. And I just wanted to um, state something that could be overlooked. It's a lovely, a lovely place to live for seniors. Like you said, there's, there's a lot for seniors to do, you know, to keep active and, you know, healthy. And, but the one thing, I'm a country girl in heart, and they've left, even though it is in the city, they have left enough um, of a setting where it has a little bit of a country feel to it. There's a lot of beautiful trees, really tall old trees. I'm one of the gardeners in the back where the two buildings join, where Coliseum 1 and Coliseum 2 meet. There's this area where we're able to have gardens. They have swings out there. And on the other side, there are wicker tables and chairs for people to socialize under a pergola. So it's, it's really, really charming. And my concern is that we would lose some of that quaint countryness if you know, like tall trees are taken down to accommodate parking, that kind of thing. I, w I would be very sad to see that because it's kind of part of what makes, makes it unique. And that's really all I wanted to say. It's a lovely place, well-maintained, and so if there were a way to do the proposed expansion without destroying the nature that we do have, then, you know, I, I guess I would have no objection, but that's my concern. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any questions for the board from, for Ms. Miller? No? Okay, you may have a seat. Okay, thank you. Uh, next person with, all right, over there. Again, give your, uh, your name and address for the record, please. Thank you. My name is Phyllis Murray. I live at 7 Coliseum Avenue, apartment 217 here in Nashua, on the property in question. And I first want to say that I do love living there. I've been there for eight and a half years. It's an ideal place for a senior citizen. There's close to amenities, it's on the bus line, it's well managed and well maintained, clean, and beautifully landscaped. Um, that said, I do have some concerns. Um, I note that the zoning allows 48 apartments on that property. There are currently almost three times that many. There has to be some limit to how many uh, units the, the property can sustain. Um, for one thing, the, the proposed new wing is, runs parallel to an existing wing, which means, and there's only maybe, it's hard to tell from the plans, but I would guess 40 to 50 feet separating them. And the uh, east side of the new wing and the west side of the existing wing face each other across that 40 or 50 feet, 
which means people will be looking across into each other's windows. That also closes that area on three sides and the only open side is to the north, which means a lot of sunlight is going to be cut off. The, uh, there are community gardens in that area and although I understand that the plan is to keep those, I don't know how much will grow there with the, with the uh, reduced sunlight. I'm also concerned about overcrowding within the, in the building in the community rooms, in the laundry rooms and so forth because in this era of COVID, we know how dangerous large numbers of indoor gatherings are and the, and the more people, the more chance of, of infection spread. So that's my first concern is just overcrowding on the property and inside the building. Uh, my second concern is that cool green spaces are scheduled to be replaced with hot pavement and, and parked cars. Uh, according to the plans, there are three shade trees that are going to be removed. Those aren't shrubs, they're mature linden trees, roughly maybe 40 feet high, and they're going to be removed to make room for parked cars, according to the plans. Um, they shade a significant portion of the building walkway. It's the main walkway that residents use when they walk to Hannaford's or when they walk across the street to the mall. There's also uh, those of us who enjoy walking around the outside of the building for exercise, and that's going to make a difference in our quality of life. According to the EPA website, a shaded area is 20 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than an unshaded area, and, and, a, and a tree can cool the air to two to nine degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm concerned about excessive heat on the property for those who, of us who enjoy exercising outside. So those are my two main concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the board? From Ms. Murray? Okay, thank you. You may sit down. Okay, anybody else with questions, concerns, or opposition to the application? Okay, not seeing anybody else in the room. Uh, is there anybody on Zoom with questions, concerns, or opposition to the application? Please use the raise hand feature if you do. Okay, not seeing anybody. Uh, okay, so uh, at this point, uh, Attorney Prunier, uh, you may come back up and have five minutes to uh, speak to the concerns that were offered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, for the record, my name is Gerald Prunier. I'm, uh, it, it's uh, interesting, in all my years, I've never seen uh, NIMBYs in the senior residence. Um, It's 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 uh, such a great place that uh, they they should be happy to have new people come in. Um, we are putting the building in the back, in the rear, and if you see the plan, there is sufficient amount of open space, and there is um, the fact the the couple of trees that we were uh, that she mentioned the three shade trees. We're going to do everything we can to save those trees. Fact is, we're gonna do everything we can to save those trees um, all around the, all around the, uh, the building. Um, we've uh, we talked about it before the meeting because uh, Mr. Walker had the chance to meet uh, when he walked around the site uh, with Ms. Murray uh, about her concerns on keeping the trees, and we are going to do that. Uh, we will be going to the planning board in the planning board, one of the requirements of the planning board is adequate landscaping. So they again will look at it uh, as to the plan that's going on. Um, COVID-19, uh, I can't say anything about it. It's, I have no control over it, neither do you. Uh, but we do have control over giving people a chance to live their lives just as the two residents came here. And we would like to do that because we have the ability to do it in the property and using the property in a proper way. Um, we will try to save the trees and we don't interfere w with the gardening that they, they want to do. 
Thank you. Any questions from the board for for what uh, Attorney Prettier said? No? Okay. Um, no, uh, Ms. Miller or Ms. Murray, you may come up and uh, have five minutes to talk about uh, what Attorney Prunier said, or you may just uh, stay. Either one of you won't wish to speak any more uh, on, on those issues. No, you don't have to. It's just a, it's it's an. If if you want to speak, please come up to the microphone. And uh, again, give your name and address for the record. Nancy Miller. Apartment 304. All I wanted to say is I'm really, really happy to live at the Coliseum Seniors Residence, and I feel blessed. And it's a home for many of us. And so I guess change for the better is good, but you know, I, I just want to reiterate that the little bit of charm it has because of how they care for the grounds means a lot to me. And that's all. <laughs> it's a wonderful place. I'm blessed to be there and call it my home. <laughs> so I thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, at this point, I will close the public meeting hearing and open the public meeting. Uh, Mr. Boucher, your comments? Um, I'm in support of the application. Um, again, I, I think that, I mean, I find that the property is unique and somewhat because of what it is and where it is um, in itself. Um, I know that that property, hit, I think it works where it is. I think that um, that um, the additional um, requests that they're asking for, I don't think overburdens uh, the lot. Uh, so I think it's very reasonable. Um, they are able to accommodate the parking um, as it needs to be. Um, I, also, I, I also know and understand um, uh, the, the two residents that came up to speak. Um, but I think that um, having been on this board for a while and having Attorney Prunia come in front of us with clients, I think when he says they're gonna do the best they can to save some trees, um, I, I think that's an earnest uh, comment and I believe in what he's saying. So, so I don't really have too many concerns about what this will look like or how it will work. I think that uh, it was successful back in 2012, the addition, and I think it'll be successful here. So. I, again, um, I'm going to support the application. Thank you. Mr. Mancara. I, I think m my initial inclination was to support the application. Um, I think, as Mr. Boucher stated, it, the, the density here already significantly exceeds wh what's allowed. But when you look at the building density, the lot coverage that we see in this area, this isn't inconsistent with that. Uh, of course, I'm referring to the commercial uses. Uh, I, I think the location is optimal for all the reasons that have already been stated, the proximity to grocery store or to, uh, you know, uh, medical offices, et, et, et cetera. Um, my, my one area of pause is that I think that the concerns that the residents raise do speak to the intensity of development on the site. Um, and, and so that, that is a concern to me in that there is little quality open space on the property and uh, to see what's there negatively impacted is, is, is a concern. Um, I, I, I'm still inclined to support it, but I, I would really like to see, you know, a, a, an effort towards trying to address those concerns, trying to preserve, um, you know, quality usable open space. The, the trees that are coming out, unless you move that parking, those 16 parking spaces, I don't see how you, or eliminate them, I don't see how you preserve those trees. Um, you know, it's a minor point, I suppose, but uh, it's all the green space that separates this property from a, you know, pretty intensely developed properties directly to the south. So, anyway, I am inclined to support it, but, but I, I'm not supporting it without some pause. 
Mr. Boucher, you, do you have another comment? Oh, just a comment. Um, they they are able to move trees. They can take, move mature trees. So, and, but but again, I don't know what the applicant's talking about when they're saying that. But um, it is done. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen it done. So, but it's amazing what they can do now with the machines they have. But they can be moved if they choose to. Mr. Courier, your comments? Um, first of all, I appreciate the comments uh, by Ms. Miller and Ms. Murray. Um, interestingly, I've always thought of this site as, as, a, as an urban setting. Um, I did go back and look again, you know, for this application. Uh, I guess I didn't get all the way to the back where the garden is, but I had always felt um, that this was a highly urban setting and if residents wanted some green space, they'd have to make it on down the Mine Falls Park or something because it's kind of surrounded by asphalt and a lot of concrete. Given, like, I guess my impression of an urban setting, while uh, the 173 units is a very dense uh, request, um, I didn't see the parking as being overburdened when I went and looked, and that, that was a testimony. A lot of red, excuse me, a lot of residents don't drive and don't need to drive, um, and so I'm I'm inclined to support it for that reason. I, I mean, I do uh, appreciate that maybe some garden space is going to be challenged. Uh, certainly, when you have shade, it's it's a better ecological thing than not having shade, but I'm not, I, I don't feel my vote or the zoning board decision really it should be taking that into consideration. Well, t I take that into consideration, but on the other hand, we do have a housing shortage and I, I concur that this is, again, I'll say it a good urban setting for, uh, for senior housing. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm inclined to support. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'm inclined to support as well. I, certainly, I, <clears throat> I do hope that the uh, that they can preserve as much green space as possible, preserve the trees. I know how important gardening is uh, to us older people. I, I, I'm not yet in a senior housing, but uh, definitely do garden, um, and uh, that that. One thing that I heard from uh, Ms. Miller and Ms. Murray was how much they love living at, uh, this, at the Coliseum and, uh, and that it's well run. So I, I have to think that the management um, is going to proceed with the interests of the residents in mind and, uh, and uh, I, will, uh, I will support the application. Somebody care to make a motion? Mr. Boucher, thank you. I'd like to make a motion to approve the area variance for 7 Coliseum Avenue Associates Limited Partnership Owner 7 Coliseum Ave, Sheet E, Lot 260, requesting a variance for Land Use Code Section 190-42, Table 42-2, for minimum dwelling units per acre, 12 units per acre, uh, 48 units permitted, 141 units existing, 173 units proposed, to construct an attached five-story 32-unit addition. It's in the GB zone uh, Ward 1, and this was postponed from the 712 meeting. Um, we find that the variance is needed to enable the applicant's proposed use of the property given the special conditions of the property. Again, um, the location of the property, um, the fact that it's uh, existed in that state for many years, um, and the surrounding um, commercial properties, and as stated, the urban environment that it is in. We find that the benefit sought by the applicant cannot be achieved by some other method reasonably feasible for the applicant to pursue than the, ear, than the variance. We find that it is within the spirit and intent of the ordinance. We find it will not adversely affect property values of the surrounding parcels. We find that it's not contrary to public interest. And we find that substantial justice will be served. So again, I make a motion to approve the area of variance. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Thank you, Mr. McCarra. Uh, any discussion of the motion? No. Ready to vote? Mr. Boucher, how do you vote? Mr. Boucher votes in favor. Mr. Mancara, how do you vote? Mr. Mancara votes in favor. Mr. Courier, how do you vote? Mr. Courier votes in favor. And I, Mr. Lionel, vote in favor. That's four to nothing. Um, the variance has been approved. Um, please be aware there's a 
30-day window of appeal. Uh, contact the planning department if you have any questions. Next case is uh, number four. Owners are Robert and Janice Early. Address is 16 Swart Terrace. Sheet 48, lot 72, requesting variance from land use code section 190-44 to exceed maximum fence height, six feet permitted, six feet existing, eight feet proposed for a 90 foot section along the rear property line. This is in the RA zone ward three. Uh, good evening. Uh, so you step up to the microphone, give your name and address for the record. My name? Yep, you can do that. My name is Robert Roy. Uh, I live at 16 Swart Terrace. Uh, I'm one of the owners uh, with my wife, Janice, who is here tonight. Uh, I've lived there 53 years. Um, we're located uh, on the southeast boundary of Greeley Park. My backyard uh, abuts the southeast boundary uh, of the park. Until recently, uh, we relied on the uh, natural buffer that uh, exists between our backyard and the park to uh, moderate uh, uh, intrusive, intrusive light and sound from the park. But earlier this year, Eversource, uh, in an effort to protect uh, their distribution line, uh, uh, eliminated a large swath of the natural buffer in Greeley Park that uh, uh, served to mitigate uh, uh, the operations and the activities in the park from uh, the neighborhood. Um, the, the damage was pretty severe and uh, left us increasingly exposed to 24-7 floodlights uh, from the park, uh, as well as uh, uh, sound from the uh, unenclosed man shell, and uh, we're less than 200 feet from the bleaches of a uh, ballpark. Um, we met with Eversource representatives. They admitted that uh, they were overzealous in their efforts to uh, preserve the uh, uh, distribution line, and they offered to replant the uh, buffer. <clears throat> I told them I was 83 years old, and I didn't know what they were going to plant, but uh, I didn't think it would be much of a race. Uh, and the, the culmination of our discussion was that they offered to uh, install an eight-foot fence. Um, uh, I currently have a six-foot fence, and I think the eight-foot fence would um, be valuable in mitigating the uh, problems we've had with park activities and operations. Um, the, uh, the neighborhood uh, is currently uh, uh, has, has a fence line that runs pretty much along uh, the, the southeast uh, border from Concord Street uh, down to the end of uh, Swart Street and Swart Terrace. And uh, there are eight-foot fences in that fence line already. Uh, in fact, uh, our uh, immediate abutter at 20 Swart Terrace uh, has an existing eight-foot fence in which to which uh, the proposed fence would connect. Uh, the the fence would be screened from uh, view uh, from the street. Um, it's located away from any traveled area, so there'd be no uh, issues regarding uh, blowdowns from uh, wind load. Uh, and we think that this is a reasonable uh, exception from the uh, zoning requirement. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the board? No? I don't see Mr. Currier's hand up. Okay. Uh, you may have a seat, sir. All right. Thank you. Yeah, yes, please, please put the <laughs> microphone back. We would appreciate that. 
Uh, is there anybody in the audience who wishes to speak in favor of this application? Okay. Is there anybody on Zoom who wishes to speak in favor of the application? Please use the raise hand feature. Okay. Is there anybody in the audience with questions, concerns, or opposition to the application? Seeing none, anybody on Zoom with questions, concerns, or opposition to the application? Okay. Seeing none, in that case, I will close the public hearing and open the public meeting. Uh, Mr. Courier, your comments? Unmute myself. Um, I, as we all may remember, we heard a similar case uh, and having looked at this, I concur that the, the special condition here is that the backyard abuts a city park uh, with that's very heavily used uh, and also what I didn't know until recently was there was a, a maintenance facility that's also noisy and well lit. And uh, I think those are two reasonable special conditions that warrant the eight foot fence. And so I am in support of the application. Thank you. Mr. Mancara. I, I'm also in support of the application for the very same reasons. Mr. Boucher. I'm also in support of the application. And I, I uh, Mr. Lionel, also in support of the application. And as Mr. Kerr said, we heard a very similar request just a few weeks ago. So uh, this is pretty, pr this is similar. Okay, uh, would somebody care to make a motion? Mr. Boucher, thank you. I'd like to make a motion to approve the area of variance for Robert E. and Janice K. Early, owners of 16 Swart Terrace, sheet 48, lot 72, requesting a variance from land use code section 190-44 to exceed maximum fence height, six feet permitted, six feet existing, eight feet proposed for a 90-foot section along the rear property line. It's in the IRA zone, Ward 3. We find that the variance is needed to enable the applicant's proposed use of the property, given the special conditions of the property. Again, um, this property uh, butts uh, the city, city park, uh, which uh, hosts a lot of activities and, um, and also is a home I believe, of the um, Parks and Recreation Maintenance Facility. Uh, we find that it, um, and we find that the benefits sought by the applicant cannot be achieved by some other method reasonably feasible for the applicant to pursue other than the variance. We find that it is within the spare and intent of the ordinance. We find it will not adversely affect property values or surrounding parcels. We find it's not contrary to public interest, and we find that substantial justice will be served. So again, I make a motion to approve the area of variance. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. McCarrick, for your second. Any discussion of the motion? Ready to vote? Okay. Mr. Courier, how do you vote? Mr. Courier votes in favor. Mr. Boucher, how do you vote? Mr. Boucher votes in favor. Mr. Mancara, how do you vote? Mr. Mancara votes in favor. And I, Mr. Lionel, vote in favor. That's four to nothing. Congratulations, your variance is approved. Uh, as I've said earlier, there's a 30-day window of appeal. Contact the planning department if you have any questions. Okay, moving on to case number five, owner I, I hope I don't mangle this name too badly. Ruin and Tina Mann. Address is 18 Langholm Drive. Sheet C, lot 47, lot 478, excuse me, lot 478. Requesting special exception from land use code section 190-47B for a major home occupation for an in-home studio, salon, and spa. This is in the R9 zone, word nine. Uh, is there somebody to present the case? Yes. Okay, please step up to the microphone. Uh, you may lower it or pull it out of the holder if you wish. Just the right uh, spot. <laughs> My name is Tina. Um, I'm the owner of um, 18 Lang Home Drive. Um, so our plan here is to renovate our unfinished basement in order to convert that to a um, uh, spa home business um, where we would offer um, facial services, waxing, um, eyebrows, eyelashes, all that fun stuff. Um, so there would be like enough parking space for the um, clients because there will be, um, it's appointment only, so there will be only one client at a time. Um, plenty of parking space in our driveway, so that wouldn't interfere any um, public parking, um, that's all. Anything else to add? Um, 
Not really. Okay, uh, we'll see if there are any questions from the board. Uh, any questions, Mr. Kurt, Mr. Boucher? Uh, just, to, just to clarify, um, I, I know that um, you had put in a number of clients and business per week, uh, three plus. So right now, what what would you estimate would be um, like daily visits, or how, how how is it that you schedule that? Just trying to get an understanding for the intensity of <laughs> the use that you're going to have. Um, so. Again, um, it's going to be by appointment only. Right now, I don't have a clientele, so I'm not sure how many per day. So um, I will be starting off slow and then working my way up. But um, a max, probably about five to six per day. Um, and the business would probably be opened five days a week. Just to follow up. So um, uh, again, is it? Are you servicing multiple clients at the same time, or is it usually one client that comes in? One client at a time. One, one client at a time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, I, I do have a question. How how will uh, clients uh, enter your home and, and and this basement unit? Is there a separate entrance? Yes, there will be a separate entrance. So they will be entering the front of the building um, of our home. Um, we usually enter through our car garage when we pull up to park. Okay. So in your application, you say three plus visits a week, and, and now you then you said five to six a day. Did I misunderstand? So um, when I submitted the application, they they wanted me to do a minor, but um, three a week was not enough for me. Um, so it's definitely going to be more than three a day. Um, so probably about like five, six, depending how long the service is going to be per day. Okay. Any more questions from the board? Mr. Boucher. Um, I think we need to check with the major home occupation special regulation. Oh, yes. Thank you. Just to verify from the office. Yes. Okay. So there are uh, 10 special regulations um, for major home occupations. Are, are you, have you been presented with these? Are you yes. familiar with them? Okay. Do you agree to all of them? Yes. You do. Okay. So we have that. Thank you, Mr. Boucher, for the reminder. Um, I think at this point, uh, you may have a seat. I have a question. Oh, oh, Mr. Courier has a question. Okay. Sorry, I didn't see you. Yep. Uh, my, my question was, I just wanted to clarify the total number of employees is listed as one. Would that one employee only be uh, Ms. Ms. Mann? Yes, myself. Okay, thanks. Okay. Is there anybody in the room who wishes to speak in favor of this application? Is there anybody on Zoom who wishes to speak in favor of this application? Not seeing any. Uh, is there anybody in the room with questions, concerns, or opposition to the application? Not seeing any. Is there anybody on Zoom with questions, concerns, or opposition to the application? Not seeing any. Okay. In that case, I will close the public hearing and open the public meeting. Uh, Mr. Mincaro, your comments. Uh, I support the application. It seems to meet the special conditions. It's going to be located entirely within the house in the basement, so there'll be no external uh, you know, evidence of the home occupation. So for those reasons, I support it. Thank you. Mr. Boucher. I also support uh, the application for the reasons uh, spoken to. Yeah. Mr. Courier. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, at first I, I had pause. I, you know, when I thought, I was thinking of three plus per week as, as a few per week, not five to six per day. But the nature of this business with just Ms. Mann being the only provider or service provider, I do see it really as just at most one vehicle, one person at a time. And I, I don't think that is, it could get uh, too aggressive, you know, for the neighborhood or the, the abutter. So I'm, I'm inclined to support, I think it meets the criteria. Thank you. And I'm also in support for the reasons stated. Would somebody care to make a motion? Mr. Boucher. Mr. McCare, I'm going to call on you to make All a motion right. next time. 
Uh, I, I, I'll make a motion to approve the special exception request of Ruin and Tina Mann, uh, 18 Lang um, Horn Drive, uh, requesting a special exception from land use code section 19047B for a major home occupation for an in-home studio, salon, and spa, uh, R9 zone, Ward 9. Uh, we find that the proposed use is listed in the table of uses will not create undue traffic uh, congestion or hazards being that there is only going to be one uh, customer at a time, will not overload public water or drainage or sewer or the, uh, or the municipal system, find that the special regulations are fulfilled and uh, there were obviously no objections from any neighbors or abutters, so it would not impair the integrity or be out of character with the neighborhood or detrimental to the health, morals, or welfare of the residents. Thank you. And Mr. Boucher, thank you for your second. I assume that's what that was. Mm -hmm. Any discussion of the motion? Uh, yeah, just assuming the, uh, the special regulation, are you referring to the major home occupation? Yes. Okay. All right. Good. All set. All right. Thank you. Mr. Courier, how do you vote? Mr. Courier votes in favor. Mr. Boucher, how do you vote? Mr. Boucher votes in favor. <laughs> Mr. Mancara, how do you vote? Mr. Mancara votes in favor. And I, Mr. Lano, vote in favor. Uh, it's four to nothing. Congratulations. Your uh, variance has been approved. And um, special exception has been approved. Excuse me. Um, so 30-day window of appeal. Get out here fast enough. Okay, number six. Case number six. The owner is M. Hogan Bristol Family Revocable Trust, Marie McLennan Trustee. Address is 972 West Hollis Street. Sheet D, Lot 116, requesting variance from Land Use Code Section 190-264 to exceed maximum accessory use area, 40% permitted, 137% proposed to construct a, a detached 28 foot by 40 foot garage with attic storage. This is in the R9 zone, Ward 5. Uh, I see you've anticipated me. You've stepped up to the microphone. Please give your name and address for the record and tell us what you'd like to do. My name is Marie McClellan. Um, it's actually M-C-C-L-E-L-L-A-N. Okay, it so, there, so it was, it was uh, misspelled in the, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, all right. Okay, I've written that down. And uh, Mr. Currier, have you have you noted the correct spelling of the applicant's name? I I have. Uh, I, I I mean, in the application, it's M C C L E L L A N. Is that what no, we have? Or? Yeah, well, it just it got yes. transcribed wrong. It got transcribed wrong. In, in, that's okay. 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 Yeah. So I'm I'm the trustee of that trust. Um, the location is 972 West Hollis Street. I've owned it since 2004. Um, it's uh, so. What I'm proposing is a garage, 28 by 40. Um, the reason it's a problem is because the house is so tiny. Um, two years ago, I came to get a, a variance to put a big house in the back, and I'm not going to probably do that within the next two years, but possibly I could do that in the future. Um, so the garage, um, the lot is 1.59, so it's a, it's a big lot, so there's plenty of room for the garage. Um, aesthetically, the reason there's storage is because I want it to look like a barn, so that the roof is going to be at a 810 peak, I believe, so that it looks more like a barn than just a flat garage. Um, it will not... Um, hurt the character of the neighborhood. The neighborhood, um, actually, since I've owned this house, I've done a lot of improvements to my house and my yard. It was actually a junkyard when I bought it. And so uh, I don't think any neighbor is going to complain that I'm putting a, a barn on it or a garage on it. Um, I'll be able to star, store um, my two cars and my partner's truck. Um, and then I have equipment to keep up the yard because I've planted apple trees and I have gardens and so I have um, plans to buy a little lawn tractor so I need the third bay <clears throat> for a lawn tractor. Um, yeah, so my house is tiny and there's not a lot of storage in it so any space that is up above the garage is great for any storage that I need. 
Um, the history of the property will show that I've improved the appearance of it since I purchased it in 2004, and I will continue to great, take great care of the property. Um, the garage is needed to keep cars out of the weather, especially um, during the winter, to have them covered. Um, now that I'm getting older, it's nice to not have to shovel off your car with the snow. Um, and it's um, in no way incringing on the property lines of any of the butters. And so that's all. I think. Any questions from the board? Not seeing anybody. Uh, I don't see Mr. Courier with his hand up. Okay, so no questions from the board. Uh, you may have a seat. Okay. Is there anybody in the room who wishes to speak in favor of this application? Seeing anybody? Is there anybody on Zoom who wishes to speak in favor of this application? No? Is there anybody in the room with questions, concerns, or opposition to the application? Okay, sir, please uh, step up to the microphone and give us your name and address, and uh, you have five minutes. And thank you for doing what you folks do. Uh, I'm Paul Mori. I live in Hollis. I'm uh, one of the co-owners of the budding lot. Uh, on right next to where the lot line is for the proposed garage. It's the first time I saw the the diagram, okay? I, probably my fault for not researching more, but I have a couple of questions. What's the setback from the property line? Um, does it meet the setback requirements? Second, uh, there's a bunch of big trees there. And I don't know whether those Excuse me, trees- Excuse sir, sir. I, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, you have to address the board. Not sure, I'm, the board I'm sorry. Board. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a number of big pine trees along that boundary line, and I don't know which ones are directly on the line or on her side or my side of the line. And is there any liability I would be picking up because of the situation of the barn very close to the property line next to those big pine trees? So that might address the location of the barn or the need to take some of those trees down before, so there's not a liability down, you know, two years from now, a windstorm comes through, goes onto the barn, it came off my property, possibly, I don't know whether they're exactly on the line or not. So that's a question. Uh, third item, as the previous speaker said, she was here a few years ago, uh, and I, I don't think the uh, variance actually came to a meeting, I think it was withdrawn before the meeting occurred, but that was for like a second residence on the property. With this size of a garage, I just want to make sure it's not uh, a backdoor approach to have a, a mother-in-law apartment or whatever in the barn, so to speak, uh, and how the board would address that as a non-conforming issue downstream. She just made a statement that uh, her intent is to possibly in a couple of years put up a, an additional structure, and where would that go in the lot in relation to what's there if she has any plans for that? I don't have any objections to it per se, other than those concerns. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Qu questions from the board? Yes, here. Yeah, Mr. Courier. Uh, j just for the record, could, could I have the name and, and the street address again? Maybe spell that last name also, please? Sure. My name is Paul Morey. That's M-O-R-E-Y. Okay. And my address is 164 Hayden Road. That's H-A-Y-D-E-N in Hollis. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anybody else in the room with questions, concerns, or opposition? Is there anybody on Zoom with questions, concerns, or opposition? Okay. Uh, Ms. McClellan, you have uh, five minutes. You can speak to the concerns that were uh, raised by Mr. Morey. Um. So there are some large pine trees, um, but they are closer to the road, and so the barn would, or the garage would actually be, um, God, probably 20 feet from those pines. Um, and I think any of the ones that are on his property are actually leaning towards his property, and they're even, even further back, so it won't even be near those trees. And then the ones that are closer to the street um, are definitely on my property. There's only one tree that is questionable that's on the line. 
Okay. And I mean, and it's not it's not going to be near it. Yeah. Okay. Well, twenty. You are, you are responsible for trees on your property, and he's responsible for trees on his property. Right. It's the ones that are on the line that's the problem. Yeah. No, that that's often a problem, but that's not a concern here. Um, okay. are, is your testimony that as I didn't see a uh, a diagram of where this. Uh, Garage would be on the on the property. Yeah, I, I didn't get one. Oh, uh, it's right up. Yeah, it's, right, it's up, up there, there, there now. Okay. So the frontage of my property is 175 feet, and it will be 66 or six, 66 feet off of the road, and it will be probably 15 feet off the line, mostly because um, the people who are building it from Pennsylvania don't want it. They want it to be 15 feet from any tree. Okay, so it meets all of the and setback And so I think it's the tree, the tree that's, well, yeah, the tree I, that's questionable that's on the line is, is well, it's the, really the, this, it's We're really, not concerned with trees. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> this is, the, I, was, I was asking whether the, uh, you could, there's a, a setback requirement from the property line. Mm. Yeah, um, and, definitely. And Mr. Falk is nodding his head, saying that yes, the application does meet uh, the setback requirements for that zone. Mm -hmm. So that's for sure. It's a ten-foot setback on the side, and it they'll meet that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's plenty okay. of room. So let's see. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's it. And, and I, I did did see see that you had a. Uh, request to build a, a, a house, but that's not before us here. So how big is your, your current house? 816 square feet. Okay, you're right, that's not very big. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right, but, thank you. Okay. Wait, question? Oh, yep, Mr. Currier. Uh, one of the other questions by Mr. Morey was, he, he was, I guess, looking for assurance, and, and so, so am I anyway, about is, is there not going to be a living unit here? I'd just like to hear the testimony to that. I assume there's going to be no running water and not nope. intended to be a living unit. No, there, there is going to be a, a bathroom, um, but it's more of a shop, you know, like a workshop. And the attic is um, not going to be living space. Okay. So, so no, I mean, I... I if I, if I ever come back to build a bigger house, it'll be using that little house again, like the um, accessory dwelling unit, but that is not gonna have living space in it. Okay, okay thank you. Yep. Okay, thank you. Okay, at this point, I will close the public hearing. Whoops, Mr. McCarry, uh -oh. did, did I miss something? I, I, I just wondered if I could ask uh, a question of Mr. Falk. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I was unclear. W was the prior variance, was the variance for the second home granted? No, it, uh, no, Mr. Sir. Sir, no. you're, you're, you, oh, you may not. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Falk. Oh, yeah, sorry it, it was granted. That's what, that was my recollection as well. Thank you. And they have not come in for a building permit or anything. It has not been built. And the applicant has said that they're not doing that at this time. They're doing this instead, so. Yeah. Thank you. And, and I, I did miss something. Okay. Um, I miss Mr. Mora, you do have the opportunity to come up and take five minutes to uh, speak to what Ms. McClellan said, if you wish. Yes, please. Uh, just as a clarification on these pines on the line, either side of the line, uh, the line is not a clear line, but one of the bounds is lost. We'll have to have it surveyed again to find out exactly where that line is. The front, the front uh, bound at the street, second, 20 feet, 30 feet from the uh, building. These pines, some of them are three feet in diameter at the base. They're 120 feet high. Uh, they're old pines. So uh, I guess I'd like the opportunity, 30 days advance notice or whatever, so that if I decide to take a tree down that's on my side of the line, before they start construction, I'd like to have that assurance. Well, so that I don't have a liability of the tree falling down, damaging from my property, and then having a big bill and whatnot. Well, the, the, the trees are, are not something that we're concerned about. Uh, okay, here. okay, with the, uh, 
You, you can you can work that out with with Ms. McClellan uh, about thank you notice. Okay. Now we're done. Okay. Now I'm going to close the public hearing and open the public meeting. Mr. Boucher, your comments. I also have to support the application. Uh, again, this is a, I call it like a classic case of the tiny house on the large lot and the accessory dwelling unit that they're asking for is, you know, we're going to exceed the percentage. Um, it's not I mean, a dwelling unit. I mean, I'm sorry. Yes. The, 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 the uh, accessory I use. I don't know why I said that. Yeah. Just the, the garage. We'll just call it the garage or the barn. Um, so, so again, um, the, the, the barn itself or the garage that looks like a barn or the garage, I, I think is reasonable. Uh, I, I think um, the scale of the property it manages this, this, this garage fine. Um, it just so happened to have a really small house that's been existing for a long time in that lot. So, uh, again, I'm going to support the application. Thank you. Mr. Courier. Uh, I support it for really the reasons that Mr. Boucher has just stated. I, I'd also like to say that I, I think it's a tasteful design. I, I kind of see this part of Nashua as a bit of country. I think people who live out there like to think it's the country, and I think this proposed design matches it. Uh, versus, uh, you know, a more industrial sort of metal frame shed. Uh, so I appreciate having the, uh, the plan of what this is going to look like in our application versus an X, Y, and Z dimensions only. Thank you. Mr. McCarrow. Uh, initially, I had pause when I, when I saw the percentage of the overage, but again, given the very small size of, of the house and the, and the large lot, uh, I support the application. Thank you. And uh, I also support the application for the reasons stated. Somebody care to make a motion? Oh, Mr. Boucher, your turn. <laughs> I'd like to make a motion to approve the area variance for M. Hogan Bristol Family Revocable Trust, Marie McClellan, trustee owner of 972 West Hall Street, Sheet D, Lot 116, requesting a variance from Land Use Code Section 190 264 to exceed the maximum accessory use area, 40% permitted, 137% proposed, to construct a detached 28 by 40 garage with attic storage. It's in the R9 zone, Ward 5. We find that the variance is needed to enable the applicant's proposed use of the property, given the special conditions of the property. Uh, again, the property is a large property, and the home is uh, on very small side of the of, of, uh, 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 average home. Uh, we find that, that the benefits sought by the applicant cannot be achieved by some other method reasonably feasible for the applicant to pursue other than the variance. We find that it is within the spirit and intent of the ordinance. We find it will not adversely affect property values of surrounding parcels. We find that it's not contrary to public interest, and we find that substantial justice would be served. So again, I make a motion to approve the area variance. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. McCara. Any discussion of the motion? Ready to vote? Okay. Mr. Boucher, how do you vote? Mr. Boucher votes in favor. Mr. McCara, how do you vote? Mr. McCara votes in favor. Mr. Courier, how do you vote? Mr. Courier votes in favor. And I, Mr. Lionel, vote in favor. It's four to nothing. The variance has been approved. Congratulations. Uh, there's a 40, 30 day. 30-day window of appeal. Uh, so please talk to the planning department if you have any questions. Okay, on to case seven. Owner Jigna and Sashin Patel, address 69 Cherrywood Drive. Sheet C, lot 2755, requesting the following variances. First, from Land Use Code Section 190-17E1 to exceed maximum driveway width, 24 feet permitted, 32 feet existing. And two, from Land Use Code Section 190-31 to encroach four feet into the six-foot required rear and right side yard setbacks to maintain an existing 13-foot by 13-foot shed. This is in the R40 zone, FUOD overlay, Ward 5. Uh, is so we have uh, somebody to present the case. Yes, um, so my client is actually in person, but I am on Zoom. Can you hear me all right? I, I can hear you. Please give your name Great. and address for the record. So good evening. My name is Amanda Flores. I'm with the law firm Gallagher and Kavanaugh. We're located at 22 Shattuck Street in Lowell, Massachusetts. I represent Dr. Sachin Patel and Mrs. Jigna Patel, um, the owners of 69 Cherrywood Drive. 
Um, Dr. Sachin Patel should be in the audience. Okay, uh, yes, I, I see. Hi, good evening. Please g you give your name and address for the record. My name is Sachin Patel. We live at the 69 Cherrywood in Nashua, New Hampshire. And uh, so we live here in this neighborhood since 2006. We purchased the house uh, in 2006. And we, by profession, I'm a physician. And I work uh, at Lowell General Hospital and my, have my practice. So we have the driveway in, um, which is very narrow and the sort, uh, not like we can park multiple cars back and forth. My, uh, we, in my family, is, we live and my parents also, we live together. My father is a 71 year old. So he's always been like when uh, two cars park in the garage and one, park is, uh, one car is parking behind that. So it's always like it was very problematic that uh, in the snow time, uh, when I have to go early or something to move the car back and either he has to park in the street and it's very inconvenient. So that's why uh, we expanded the driveway initially in the first phase kind of thing uh, um, closer to the, my home and uh, like from 24 to 32 two feet. I didn't know about the variance or anything but then we found out later on. So but what was happening, like there was a tree behind. So even when my father was pulling out the car, the tree was getting crossing behind that. So there was a small like a shrub kind of thing. So it was hitting, so that's why we ext like we expand the driveway all the way up to the curb kind of thing from 24 to 32 feet wide. Uh, uh, we, I kept in the mind there is a, between my plot and the, my neighbor lot, there's a, enough buffer. Uh, like uh, more, more than five feet of loan is still there. There's a small retaining wall, which is in my yard, which is almost like a three to four feet away from the property line. And uh, for the snow plowing, there is no like a, so this is more convenience for kind of thing, uh, uh, rather than parking on the street, and which is uh, very more hazardous to the snow plowing. Uh, for the city, even for the, my neighbor, like somebody pulling out and can hit the car uh, in the street. So mm, that's the purpose we expand the driveway and it's good for my father, he's handicapped kind of thing, so he doesn't have to park on the street. And we try to keep the like, uh, uh, like uh, appearance of the house and everything always night, nice and quiet. Also in the back, uh, uh, we put the sad in the right uh, rear end. Uh, uh, so sad is like a uh, nine, nine foot and uh, eight inch uh, in height. And we use that uh, to store the, like uh, some snow equipment, like snow plow and those things, uh, bicycles, the kids toys and some patio furniture. So it's very nicely kept and everything. And aesthetically, we kept in the mind that uh, uh, siding of the shade is the same as my house. And there is a small couple of window on the front. Uh, so aesthetically, we try to keep everything in the nice way. And uh, there is a fence uh, after the, so it doesn't, uh, is very well maintained property. And so, uh, we just looking for the variance so it can, should be kept uh, that so that will be good for uh, we love this neighborhood uh, and that's the uh, only thing to say any questions from the board so uh, um, uh, if i may um well okay we we're still we still have time right Ms. Furry? okay yes uh go ahead oh i'm sorry how much time do we have um ten, yeah, ten minutes okay so i'll just you know um kind of add to what my client has um, you know, described to the board. So the original driveway was among the most shallow in the neighborhood. Um, the driveway was so, so shallow, as he said, that he could not egress from the garage, which was uh, necessitated by, you know, in winter conditions, having his vehicle clean when he's called for emergency medical procedures um, as necessary. So he was not able to pull out of the driveway conveniently um, with his father's vehicle parked in the driveway as well. Um, so his dr new driveway expanded is 32 feet. The variance allows, or sorry, the um, ordinance allows a 24 foot driveway. So the spirit of the ordinance is really to have basically 12 feet per car. Um, Dr. Patel's driveway does not 
you know try to expand this into a three car driveway it's really just to make this existing driveway usable and if you look at the photograph on the second page of our response to the objection there's a really good aerial view of the neighborhood which shows you know this is a small footprint it's on page two yeah it's that one um this is still a small footprint driveway compared to some of the other driveways which allow up to 10 vehicles just in this shot alone so granting the variance um, you're really permitting a usable driveway um, and it's it's not disturbing you know the essence or character of the neighborhood at all with respect to the shed if we can pull to the first photo in that same pdf um or sorry it's in the other down it's on page three yes so with the shed um you know it's a sightly shed it matches the home it's um under 12 feet within the boundary and the fence and it is located in the only practical location due to the easements um in the past and now existing in the backyard which are shown in that photograph um, the neighboring sheds are similarly positioned in the back rear corner um, so this is not unusual for the neighborhood and again within the fence boundary of the neighbor abutting neighbor's lot and i can open it up to questions okay any uh, <laughs> questions for attorney flores mr mancara when, when you when you're talking about the size of the driveway and how shallow it is are are you saying that it is not sufficiently deep uh to hold two cars two, two suvs um you know front to back no front to back. thank you I, I, <clears throat> any uh, other questions from the board I, I have one courier mr. courier yeah I guess uh, as I uh, w w go through the, the neighborhood uh, I, I concur that at 69 it, it's a shorter driveway but I I see many driveways that are long and many that are short and uh, I, I see others that are short and but respect the 24 foot within the front yard setback and i guess I, i'm struggling I, I don't disagree that it's one of the shorter ones but but i don't find it's unique to the neighborhood it's it's common to all the properties that have a shorter driveway and, and i just follow up with uh when we're looking for you know a variance criteria i i appreciate uh you know the the needing to run out of an emergency but i just have to ask why why wouldn't you just park the outside car not behind a car that might have to pull out in an emergency so in a in a snow situation where um the car outside would be covered in snow that's not going to allow dr patel to leave when he's on call to head to the hospital quickly so the car his car needs to be clean in the driveway i mean in the garage and and how would it get out if it was if there was another car parked so in? he does he does have a plow company come but still you know if the car is not easily accessible i mean that's that would be an issue i guess i'm i'm a little bit confused as to what cars are being parked where i mean as mr courier said the uh, dr patel's driveway isn't really any shorter than many of the others in that neighborhood um, and it's not clear to me why uh, it needs to be expanded and or actually why it was expanded uh, without the variance and also the that the, the shed position uh, also required a variance and apparently was not requested um, I, 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 I'm not really convinced that there's a if there's a need for expanding the driveway it, where it, they simply could be managing the the position of the cars uh to allow easier access in case of emergency 
So the driveway expansion, you know, does not affect the neighborhood at all. Um, you know, especially where, like Mr. Courier had pointed out, there are driveways in the neighborhood with significantly, you know, significantly longer. Um, if you look at the front of the house, this does not look like a, cr a crazy expansion. This is eight feet of expanded um, tar, which, you know, he could be parking the car on the grass in the same area, but instead it, gives the appearance to the neighborhood of a larger driveway and it you know generally looks better having vehicles parked in a driveway on on tar that, that wasn't what i asked it's okay <laughs> okay uh, mr boucher um the uh before were there other options that the that your client had um, considered um, before expanding the driveway to the street um, to obviously uh, park that outside vehicle out of the way um, so it was uh, convenient to get in and out but not inconvenient for um, Dr. Patel to get out of the garage? So he had, like he said, removed a shrub, um, but you know, the other solution really is to park on the street, which there is a parking ban, is, you know, my understanding from 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. in Nashua. Um, and so that, you know, would violate that. And otherwise, you know, he needed to expand the driveway. I, I understand that he did so prior to obtaining a variance, and that is obviously a mistake that we all acknowledge. Um, but those are the efforts that he tried. There, there is no other option with the depth of the driveway and the placement of the garage um, to expand parking. So just to follow up, just so I can get a better picture. Mm -hmm. the, the original expansion of the driveway um, with, the, with the, the, the turn in to the, to the third, to the third width, to the, on the right side of the garage, with the vehicle parked there, right um at that point if the vehicle that's parked outside is parked there <laughs> then we can get in and out of the garage correct i'd have to defer to dr patel on the um, the stage so, one of the so when we had that actually a few times because we had small shrub in behind the in the grass and my father when he was pulling out he was like hitting that uh, uh shrub and like a couple of times he'd like totally get and uh when he was making turn, because there is a, a retaining wall here on this side, so when he may make a big turn, sometimes wheel can go over there. So that's why we try to we expand this so he can go straight out back. Mr. Mankara. So may I ask, how many cars do you have? How many cars do you park on the property? We uh, just two cars in garage and uh, one car, one more car. Yeah. So a total of three cars. Yep. We don't have an intention to park like 10 car or anything like this is not the per. Yeah. Just, just to follow up, just um, have you considered, um, and I understand the way you have the current driveway, the addition, the phase one addition, um, pulling in there um, maybe doesn't give you enough length to straighten out. Did you consider um, um, paving uh, parallel to the garage, going for a little further down, and giving yourself more opportunity to be able to uh, easily turn into the existing driveway? I didn't know that uh, that is option kind of thing when we did that kind of thing. Like, uh, but I I heard that you can go all the way next to the my house kind of thing. Right. I had to check with that. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. So, go, so that. So, so I guess what I'm saying is that that would have been a viable option if you knew about it. Uh, if I knew about that, but uh, again, that like uh, uh, the clearing the snow and everything, that was this was more like look uh, more look wise and everything, the logistic option. That's why we went with these things. There was no purpose to uh, disobey anybody or like hurt anybody's property. There was no intention like that. But this uh, like aesthetically looked good. So, and we wanted to have the maintain on the side of the uh, house. So that's, that's the only reason. All right, thank you. 
Thank you. Okay, so let me see if I understand this correctly. You have three cars, uh, one of which is yours that, that you need access to at all times. So he could park in the garage with nothing behind it. And you have two other cars, one of which could park in the garage and the other one behind that. Is that correct? We, when we did that kind of thing, because also my brother, my brother, he just moved out. So that's why we had four car kind of thing. And now my daughter is go, going to be turning 15. So uh, I'm assuming within one year, I, I don't have right now. I'm giving you honest answer. Uh, before we had four car, now we have three car. But my daughter is going to be turned 15. So I'm assuming within one year, I will have another one car. My brother is also a physician, but he moved to the Stamford in Connecticut uh, after he got married. Before we, so he was also living with us. And okay, so currently you have three cars. Three cars. One is yours, one is your father's, and my wife. And your wife has one, yeah. okay. And my daughter, is, she just uh, entered into high school and she's. No, she's going to be 15 now. So I'm uh, thinking in future we'll have another car. In, in okay. Money. You're going to have a problem still then, right? Sorry? You're going to still have a problem then. No, then uh, this is a, uh, that's the reason. Because when you're for uh, one car, it can go behind this car. So at least still my, uh, my uh, garage will be clear. My father car can stay into the extension part. And the, another new car can stay in the, uh, behind the one garage, and the, another garage can be okay. clear. Any more questions I'll, from the board? I just really appreciate uh, if uh, they grant this uh, uh, approval. There's, I, I'm not saying that, but uh, really, uh, even at the COVID time, we helped a lot, many people, and because I was like going over there uh, throughout the, and it's more convenience for this sort of thing. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any, any other questions from the board? No? Yeah. Oh, Mr. Courier. Uh, a question for Ms. Flores. If you could clarify for me on the right side, how far is the fence from the property line and how far is the shed from the property line? Sure. So the property line is at an angle. Okay, so at the base point where it meets Cherrywood Drive, we're looking at five feet from the um, driveway to the property line. And then when we are in the back at the shed point, and I'm on page three again of that, well, yes, you're looking at the survey, that's fine. Um, the shed encroaches four feet into the six foot setback. Okay, so the, the fence, which we don't see on this drawing, uh, in the back. Fence is, mm -hmm, sorry. If you could just, maybe, maybe you said it and I missed it, but let's, let. If, how far is the fence, where is the position of the fence back by the shed uh, as compared to that property line we're looking at? So the fence, should be to the left slightly of the property line. Okay, like slightly, is that like six inches, a foot? Uh, it no. should be about a foot. But again, we're talking oh. an angle, so it gets closer as we're further in the back of the property. Okay, and then write what uh, Ms. Poirier has. What does TBR mean under the shed? So this plan was created, I believe, before the shed was moved there. So it to be, I don't know if um, Dr. Patel knows what it, what the so, surveyor had written there, but this was a, a proposed plan prior to the easement being moved and for the shed to be located. Because I'm not sure, but when I no. see TBR, I, I see that as to be removed, but I, I, I wanted to clarify that with, with you. So there, there was, I believe, talk in an initial um, zoning board meeting about the easements, about removing the shed and the gazebo, which I believe has been removed. 
I guess could we uh, have Mr. Patel back for him to clarify yes. if the gazebo is present or removed and if there was a commitment to remove the shed, why is it on this plan that went before the planning board? Uh, can I, so yeah. So basically the answer to the first question, fans, in the front is almost like a, when you start, is three to four feet uh, away from the property line. As it goes towards the back, is more almost like close to two feet away from the property line. The, this is the old plan kind of thing. When the, before it was the, the new, prop, this, this, no, the current plan is uh, um, which was done when in front of planning board. We, there is no like a TBR over there. So, and that's why planning board created the condition when they give the easement uh, relocation to get the variance for the set and the, for the driveway. It was one of the condition. So I need to require the uh, variance for the set and for the driveway. That's why we presented here today. Uh, so we can keep the set and the driveway uh, as it is. And we, uh, and we are looking for the approval from you. Yeah. Well, I guess that the plan we have, which we were just looking at, was signed by the surveyor and, and the property owner just like last month. I think it was June 15th. And so that's why I don't understand why the, the, the TBR is on there. I mean, I see. I guess I'm seeing that this is this is the accepted plan, very current, that is should be adhered to. But the new plan is uh, by the done by the engineer because they were looking topographic plan uh, by the Mr. Ben Osgood, and uh, that is filed to the registry of deed. Um, I give it to the Mr. Scott McPhee and Myler copy. And uh, that does not have these things actually, the TBR. So um, Mr. McPhee knows that and he's, he, uh, yeah. So there's no TBR in that one. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I, what I'm seeing in the record is that the, uh, the placement of the shed seems to have been uh, affected by the drainage easement. And, um, and given, given the easement and there was a, a request to move the easement, but I'm not, I don't think that actually happened. Uh, is that correct, Dr. Patel? The easement relocation, they approved that uh, with the condition of this, uh, 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 like uh, getting all the other things, these things get fixed. So they approved the easement relocation, see. which is, a, is shown as a dotted line in the plan. The amended easements have been recorded. So this new dotted line is a new easement. Okay. So the, uh, uh, before there was showing the easement was going through the, like very close to my home and through the gazebo area, but we never had the water was collected. Water was always going, flowing through the back of the my yard. So that's why the, they did the topographic plan, the engineer, and they brought the proper location of the easement. Okay, I, I understand it now, thank yeah. you. Further questions okay. from the board? And uh, the said is the, that's the only appropriate location because if I move, put anywhere else, it will go into the easement. Yeah, I, so I understand that. Yeah. Any other questions from the board? No. Mr. Curry, you're satisfied for now? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. You may have a seat. Is there anybody in the audience with, who wishes to speak in favor of this application? Uh, sir, please come, come up to the microphone, give your name and address for the record. Hi, my, my name is Jay Parikh. Uh, I live at 68 Cherrywood Drive, uh, directly across from Dr. Patel's property. Um, couple of comments. Um, I would rather have people's driveway expanded than have cars on the street. A um, few reasons, in winter, uh, Cherrywood Drive is not one of the best ones plowed and it's very slopey. So if I, if there's a car where my driveway is backing out, if I'm backing out of the driveway and his car is on the street, I have very little confidence with the current plowing that city does that I can stop in time and not hit their cars. Um, number two, 
their plow guy, when he does the plowing, he always takes the snow from that additional piece of driveway and pushes it into the front yard, so the front of his house. So he's not dumping it into neighbor's yard. He pulls it back and he pushes it to the side. Um, and that's my two big things is I have driven through the neighborhood in summertime and people have visitors or people have work going on, landscapers. Even though the street is relatively wide compared to some of the old Nashua streets, it's still very narrow. Um, a lot of people are putting in the driveways on the side and I really appreciate whenever they do that, that way there are less cars on the street. Um, like somebody mentioned, I think uh, it was Attorney Flores, I'd rather see cars parked on a paved driveway rather than grass, which some of our neighbors in the neighborhood do because they don't have the paved driveway on the side. Uh, maybe they are aware of the variance and they don't want to go through the process, so they just park on top of grass because then you don't need any permission. So uh, that's why I would uh, voice my concern, or not concern, voice my opinion in favor of approving the variance. Thank you. Any, qu any questions from the board? No. no? Okay, thank you. Anybody else in the audience with, question, with uh, wishes to speak in favor of the application? Is there anybody on Zoom? Okay, I see a hand up. Uh, are you, uh, Mr. Rathi, are you going to speak in favor of the application? Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak uh, opposed, so well, I'll then, wait. Uh, wait. Please wait for that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is there anybody in the audience with questions, concerns, or opposition to the application? No? Is, oh, I see Mr. Rathi, you, are, you have questions, concerns, or opposition. Please give your name and address for the record. Yes, I'm Bharat Rathi. I live at 67 Cherrywood Drive, um, the adjoining lot to the applicant. Um, I have sent in my response, and I truly hope that everybody, that every um, board member has read that. We have. Completely. Thank you. Um, my concerns, um, I'm not going to go through all the concerns because there are quite a few, but I will go through some of them here. Um, the driveway has been expanded to 32 feet. It is actually directly next to my property. Now, they stated it was five feet from the property line. If you take a look, it's only two feet at the curb, and it's not narrower when you get further in. So it's only about two feet. There's really no buffer between my yard. And now, I did mention that if it, there is a large tree in my yard, and if it were to fall over, it could possibly hit somebody who's parked in that, uh, you know, that third lane. That would be my liability, whereas previously I did not have that liability. Okay. Now, the other thing is, uh, Jay Barak stated that uh, the we call plow guy is plowing it into, you know, Dr. Patel's lot. But that was only true for the last year after I complained a lot. He has been, he has been plowing it into my yard consistently in the previous years. And I had bills from my landscaper showing them, showing that he's had to fix sprinkler heads, what he call, in my front yard. Okay. I mean, that's been consistently happening. Okay. Um, sometimes I fixed it them myself, but uh, several times, you know, the landscapers come out there and fix those sprinkler heads. Because when you pile three lanes of uh, snow onto there, you get a lot of snow, a lot of ice, and so on. Okay. Um, again, uh, so that's an issue that's been there. Um, the second part was the variance for the shed. Now, that, that should not be granted at all. This is a very large structure. Now, it is not a small shed like the other people have. It is taller, uh, taller than 12 feet. Now, he said it was only uh, what he called 9.8 feet. But in his diagram, he even shows in the front, it is 13.3 feet. Now, when you have a shed that's taller than 13.3 feet, the setback rules are totally different. The setback rules are not 6 feet. The setback rules are 10 feet from the side and 20 feet. But that is not in the application. Okay, you know, in the application, and it was only stated that this is violating a six-foot setback rule. Okay, the other problem here is the shed also hides drainage system, and has been redirecting stormwater onto my yard. 
It is definitely water trespass, and that's a big issue. This, uh, and in the September 2021 planning board meeting, uh, planning board agenda, this shed was to have been removed. But the zoning board hasn't provided any justification for changing the position of this. Now, right at the foot of the, what do you call, shed, there is an underground pumping station. Now, this pumping station is in violation of permitting and zoning setback rules, and this should be removed. Uh, the planning department is well aware of this structure. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure why that, what do you call, pumping station is now uh, uh, allowed to remain there. Okay. Now, does... Um, Anybody have any questions for me or want any more clarification about what I had sent in for a response? Uh, well, uh, let me comment, uh, sir, that as far as the tree is concerned, um, mm -hmm. I, uh, the tree is, is your liability no matter what, and um, if an eight-foot extension to the driveway is probably not going to make all that much difference. Uh, you testified that... Um, Dr. Patel's uh, snow plowing service is no longer uh, pushing snow onto your property, so that does not seem to be an issue, and that is also not relevant to uh, the widening of the driveway. Um, as far as the pumping station, that's not zoning board's concern. Um, and the, uh, the regulation, if I, Mr. Falk will correct me if I'm wrong, because um, I've had this question before, has to do with the, the midpoint of the, the, the shed height uh, in terms of determining the, whether the setback is, is larger. Is that correct? Well, according to the ordinance 190-31, the setback to a side or rear is six feet, no matter what. It's just the, the maximum height within 10 feet of a property line is 12 feet. And that's measured between the midpoint between the eave and the ridge. So whatever that value is, that's where we measured the height. Okay, and, and the shed f f is less than that. Right. Yes, okay, so that's, that's not an issue. Um, so, and other board members with questions for? I, yeah, I do. Uh, Mr. Courier. I, for, for Mr. Rathie, in, in the letter that you sent there was a picture of the shed and a broken fence. I, I guess it was from the back of your house. I was just wondering if you could elaborate that. How, how long was that in disrepair? Was that an extended time or just after a storm or just trying to get an idea of what grievance uh, you, you might you have with that situation? Um, yes. Um, what he had stated in the application that he had maintained everything. You know, um, the grievance was that, even though he stated that, uh, uh, he only repaired the fence after he needed a variance. Okay. Uh, he did not repair the fence for several years. Uh, it's been that way for three or four years. Okay. They did, um, once when he was having his, um, you know, the, the drainage system put in, um, they fixed it. But then, it, again, it went back to being in disrepair. Okay. So it's been that way for a few years, um, uh, probably four, four or five years now. Okay, uh, thank you for that clarification. Any other questions from the board for Mr. Rathi? No, okay. Uh, okay, uh, anybody else on Zoom with questions, concerns, or opposition to the application? Seeing none, okay, uh, Dr. Patel, you uh, and or uh, Attorney Flores uh, has five minutes to uh, speak to the concerns that were raised. So here I don't want to prove anything kind of thing, but uh, there is no sprinkler between the my property line and Mr. Rati line, there is no sprinkler. We have taken picture. The sprinkler is on the other side of over there. So if, as I was manson, it was never mentioned that any sprinkler was broken kind of thing, or it was I was never notified even. And as Jay Parari can witness that, he always piled from the beginning, because we want that space open. If uh, we pile the snow towards that pile, my father will be not able to park on that uh, side. So we always, uh, the snow plowing guy, you always pull 
pull the snow on other side of the driveway so that uh, parking space can remain clear because there is a wall so it cannot go beyond that kind of thing and uh, uh, the fans it was like we fixed that because there was a snowstorm some uh, couple of uh, uh, piles came out and uh, as soon as if we notified we fixed that so it's not a uh, I cannot answer this not fixed for four or five years. There is no like, but it wasn't like that long. It's just like a, when we were total, and it was like there was windstorm, the few uh, things came out, and I put it back. Because fence is the way, like uh, there is a lattice on the top. Sometimes it comes out, and uh, it, we've put that back. And uh, this time I put that like a uh, screw, so it cannot come out even that kind of thing. So it's like no you. So I'd like to address um, Mr. Rathi's point that the driveway is within two feet at the curb of his property line. Um, this is an over or underestimation severely because this retaining wall exists on Dr. Patel's property line. A really good image of this again appears um, in the top right corner of page three of our response to his objection, um, which clearly shows that there's a driveway, a retaining wall, grass that belongs to Dr. Patel, and then the property line. This cannot be two feet. Yeah. Well, actually, it doesn't matter <coughs> because a, a driveway is allowed to go right sure. up to the property line. Yes. Yes. Okay. And yesterday, me, me, I measured the height with the, and I sent the picture the, from the midpoint to the set I sent to the picture. And it's not more than like even, a, I say, 10 feet kind of thing. Even. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we've already established that. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Uh, okay, uh, Mr. Rathi, you have five minutes to speak to uh, what you just heard. Uh, please don't bring in anything new. Uh, no, I'm all set. Okay, that's, that's your option. That's fine. Okay, at this point, I will close the public hearing and open the public meeting. Mr. Mancara, your comments? Uh, I, I do find support uh, for the shed. I, I think overall it's a fairly small property. Um, a, a shed of that size, I think, is a reasonable use on a residential property, and it would be challenging to locate it given the easement um, in you know any other area to meet the setback. So, so I do support the shed. Uh, I, I I can't find support for the expanded driveway, um, but there are you know four spaces that are available on the site. I see nothing uh, distinct or unique about the property. It seems to be very similar to other properties in the neighborhood. Uh, the driveway, I don't see excessive driveways elsewhere uh, in the neighborhood either in terms of width. So I can't say that wider driveways are consistent with the character of the area. It seems to me to be the uh, argument in favor of the variance is merely a management issue of how cars are parked and shoveled shuffled on the, on the property. Uh, so I, I, I don't find support for the driveway expansion. I do find support for the shed. Thank you. Mr. Boucher. Um, I also find support for, for the shed. Um, um, I think that's reasonable. Um, and again, uh, it doesn't uh, impact uh, any neighbors to the rear. Um, and I believe that the position on the side, uh, again, doesn't uh, deter or take away anything from the neighbor that it butts. Um, the, the driveway, um, struggle with that one. Um, I, I think I'm in the same position that Mr. McCare is, is at. Uh, I think it's a management issue. Um, I am always, um, you know, listening to, you know, especially today where, you know, uh, we all need cars to drive. Um, but again, this, I don't find, uh, like Mr. McCarris, anything unique about the home. It's um, if, the, if the home was close place to the, closer to the street where we could only get maybe one or one and a half cars in, um, I, I think there, there would definitely be some um, you know, discussion there or, or you know, more favorable for, for me. But I think at this point, I, I, I don't see it. I, I think uh, the, the, the phase one of the expansion um, I think would have been a reasonable, to me was a reasonable uh, get at, at getting a car out of the way. Um, again, uh, I don't find 
really support at this point for the driveway expansion. Thank you. Mr. Courier. Uh, I, too, uh, find support for the shed for the reasons stated. Uh, I, I don't find support for the driveway. I mean, I, I do go through this development a lot. Uh, and I've always been impressed with how nice it is. Uh, it's kind of, you know, disappointed Mr. Shaw wasn't with us tonight because he lives here. But I see quite a few driveways that have been expanded, not within not up to the curb, uh, quite a few of the shorter ones. Uh, and and I, I think those are all tastefully done and they seem to work fine. Uh, I, if if this were to be approved, to me, it's it's every shorter driveway is is, is consistent to this. And it so I, I don't find support for the for the driveway, you know, particularly if this was a new request and not already there. I. I'd be the same way. I, I, I think, uh, and, and I guess I do think that this looks wider and has more of an asphalt feel about it than the other properties uh, at Maplewood. So that, that, that's where I'm at. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I similar uh, opinion. The shed, uh, I don't have a problem with where it is. Um, it uh, meets the other requirements, but the driveway. Um, it, as was said, it's sort of a management issue and driving through the neighborhood, I don't see uh, similar, uh, you know, I see a lot of the short, short driveways uh, that are within the 24 foot width. Um, I, I do comment that even the, the, that phase one expansion might be in violation of the rule that uh, the driveway has to be 24 feet within the front yard setback. Uh, I did not measure to see uh, whether that was the case of, of that swoop, but I do know that a lot of people do that um, and without consideration to what the ordinances say. Uh, so I, I am in support of the shed location. I am in not in support of the driveway expansion and that uh, both of these were done after the fact is uh, not helping. So uh, let's see, whose turn is it to make a motion? Mr. Mancara's turn, I think. Uh, let's let's split these two out. Right, so we'll do say. We'll, yes. We'll do the uh, the shed first. Uh, well, no, we'll do the, we'll do them in order. So we'll do the driveway first and then the shed. All right. So I'm going to make a motion um, not to approve the area uh, variance request for Virginia and Sasha and Patel. And I, I apologize for mispronouncing the names. 69 Cherrywood Drive requesting a, a variance from land use code section 19017E1 to exceed the maximum driveway width, 24 feet permitted, 32 feet existing, uh, I, I would say proposed. Uh, and I think uh, the board finds that the variance is not needed to enable the applicant's proposed use of the property, given that four cars can be parked um, uh, on the site within the requirements and that there really is no special condition of the property itself, but rather it's really a management issue. Um, we found that it's not within the spirit and intent of the ordinance, uh, that it may uh, affect negatively the property value of surrounding properties. At least we did have one neighbor testifying an objection, um, and that it is contrary to the public interest, and that I, I don't see substantial justice would be done. So for those reasons, I make a motion not to approve the area variance request. Okay, uh, do I have a second? Mr. Boucher, thank you for your second. Any discussion of the motion to deny the uh, driveway variance? Okay. Mr. Courier, how do you vote? Mr. Courier votes in favor of the motion to deny. Mr. Boucher, how do you vote? Mr. Boucher votes in favor of the denial. Mr. Mankara, how do you vote? Mr. Mankara votes in favor of the denial. And I, Mr. Line, I'll vote in favor of the denial of the area variance for the driveway. I'm sorry, uh, the va that variance has been denied. Um, okay, make a motion for the shed, please. I'm sorry, I'd like to make a motion to approve the area variance request of Virginia and Sasha and Patel, 69 Cherrywood Drive, requesting a variance from land use code, um, maybe move up to it. Uh, section 19031 to encroach four feet into the six foot required rear and side yard setbacks to maintain an existing 13 by 13 shed 
in the R40 zone, uh, Ward 5. Uh, we find that the variance is needed to enable the applicant's proposed use of the property, given that a variance, uh, or sorry, that a shed is a normal and customary use, uh, given the relatively small size of the property and the existence of the easement, there are really no other areas where the shed could be located. We find that it is within the spirit and the intent of the ordinance, that it will not adversely uh, affect the property uh, values of surrounding parcels, although there was testimony in objection, I think we found that the height issues that were raised uh, are consistent with the ordinance requirements, uh, that it's not contrary to the pu uh, public interest, and that substantial justice would be done. So for those reasons, I make a motion to approve the area variance. Thank you. Mr. Boucher, for your second. Any discussion of the motion? <coughs> Mr. Mincara, how do you vote? Mr. Bacara votes in favor. Mr. Boucher, how do you vote? Mr. Boucher votes in favor. Mr. Courier, how do you vote? Mr. Courier votes in favor. And I, Mr. Lionel, vote in favor. Okay, so that's four to nothing for the shed variance. Uh, for both of these uh, decisions, both the approval of the shed variance and the denial of the driveway variance, there is a 30-day window of appeal. Uh, you can make a rehearing request. Uh, please contact the planning department if you wish to do that within 30 days. Thank you. Okay. Moving Mr. On. Lino, you consider a uh, five-minute recess? Yes. Oh, sure. Okay. Five-minute recess. We will we'll resume at 8.31.
Okay, we're going to get started again. And uh, Mr. Courier, I've just sent you an email with photos of uh, three maps that uh, the applicant for the next case sent to me, so you have them for reference. And I hope he heard me for that. Okay. Yeah, I heard you. I uh, just unmuted myself. They're in my inbox. I'm looking at them now. Yeah, Thank very, you. very good. Okay. So, case number eight. Uh, owner, owner is Douglas Dishard and David Bibbo. Address 60 Lund Street, sheet 102, lot 216, requesting the following variances from land use code section 190 16, table 16.3. Uh, from new lot 216, minimum lot area 6,000 square feet required, 5,178 square feet proposed. Two, minimum lot depth 80 feet required, 71 feet proposed. Three, from new lot 216-1, minimum lot area 6,000 square feet required, 5,178 square feet proposed. And four, minimum lot depth 80 feet required, 67 feet proposed. All requests to subdivide one lot into two lots, existing house to remain on lot and construct one new single family home. This is in the RB zone ward six. Uh, I see somebody is to present the case. Please give your name and address for the record. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Brad Westgate. I'm a lawyer with Weiner and Bennett at 111 Concord Street in Nashua, uh, representing uh, Doug Deschard, uh, David Bebo, who are the owners and applicants of the property at 60 uh, One Street. Uh, all they're here in the audience tonight, as is uh, Ethan Beals of Hainer Swanson. Uh, Hainer Swanson is the project surveyors and engineers. Uh, they're the ones who prepared the ZBA exhibit plan, the one with the application, and a copy of it uh, is uh, I've seen handed out to everybody just now, just for your convenience. Also on Zoom is Rob Crowl, excuse me, uh, uh, Rob Claremont, who's a, a real estate broker who's been involved in this uh, matter in this transaction. This property at 60 Lund Street, Mr. Chairman, uh, has an existing single family home with a deck, pool, detached garage, and shed. The property has about 150 feet of frontage along Lund Street and a total area of 10,356 square feet. The house and the other improvements are frankly in poor condition. The assessor's office records indicate that the house was built around 1940 initially. Of course, we're in the RB district, as the application indicated. RB district, as the board well knows, has a 6,000 square foot minimum lot area requirement, 50 foot frontage requirement, 60 foot lot width requirement, and 80 foot lot depth requirement. Uh, the property is serviced by water, sewer, and natural gas, electric power, telephone, cable television, of course. Lund Street area is near the city center core. It's a relatively densely developed neighborhood, uh, includes a number of uh, single family dwellings, uh, relatively modest uh, size lots, if you will. The handouts that I gave Mr. Chairman that I appreciate you being able to dutifully send along to Mr. Curry uh, are, just so you note, the first uh, handout is the plan prepared by Hannah Swanson that we attached to the application with a little bit of annotation I've made. It's now up on the screen. The second handout is the is a bit of a blow up of the GIS map in the immediate 60 Lund Street area. And the third handout is a larger uh, scale um, air, uh, blow up from GIS of the Lund Street area, Dexter Street as well, nearby streets from Lake Street down to approximately the 60 Lund Street parcel. I'll explain, just point out to a few things on those as we go. The other handouts are three supporting letters uh, from uh, abutters, immediate abutters, and one uh, letter from Mr. Claremont, who also analyzes the um, property from a, um, at a uh, impact on property values perspective. So what's proposed again, Mr. Chairman, is to Keep the existing house, but renovate it, rehab it, need significant rehab. Get rid of the garage, pool, shed, and much of the concrete that's decking, if you will, around the shed, some of the concrete decking that would stay with the uh, existing house. Subdivide the two properties, sub, excuse me, subdivide the property into two equal lots of approximately 5,180 uh, square feet each. The two properties would 
have a lot depth of 67 feet on the sort of more uh, northerly one, the one on the Lake Street side, and about a 71-foot lot depth on the existing house side. The idea, of course, would be, a, would be to build a new single-family home on the new lot and, again, rehab the existing single-family home that's presently located. So that generates the need for the two variances, the being around 822 feet shy of the 6,000 square foot minimum lot area requirement on each lot, and on the one hand, 13 feet shy of the lot depth requirement, and 9 feet shy of the lot depth requirement on the two respective lots. The applicants uh, have communicated and made arrangements with Rob Crowley, who's a um, local a real estate uh, developer, builder, person who's had significant uh, renovation rehab experience to sell the properties to them if all goes well. Of course, we have to go to the planning board if we're uh, fortunate enough to be successful this evening. Um, Mr. Crowley would be uh, the, the ultimate uh, person doing the rehab work. He's done that on a number of properties, including uh, several on Abbott Street, for example, uh, one that's uh, still undergoing. So except for these dimensional variances we're requesting, the property would meet all dimensional requirements. The existing house has some, uh, is, given its age, uh, has some pre-existing uh, uh, setback, um, uh, portions of it in the front yard setback, uh, but that's a pre-existing condition noted by Mr. Falk when he analyzed this application for his administrative decisions. If I may go to the five criteria for granting of a variance, Mr. Chairman, and address them. Yes. So as the board well knows, the five criteria for granting of a variance uh, go as follows. The first is that the variance request not be contrary to the public interest. And we would respectfully submit that it's in the public interest to allow two residential lots, each with approximately 822 square feet less than the minimum lot area requirement of 6,000 square feet and with approximately 9 feet and 13 feet of lot depth less than the minimum 80-foot lot depth requirement when these, grant, when these variants would be consistent with the city's land use code's objective to encourage infill property development, that's noted in the purposes of the dimensional provisions in the city land use code, and permit new residential development on an infill parcel which helps facilitate upgrades and renovations to an older dwelling. In addition, we would submit, Mr. Chairman, that the overall result in the lot sizes is not inconsistent with those immediately abutting the property to the east. If you are able to take a look at the second exhibit, the blow up of the GIS plan, you can see what I mean. Dexter Street is to the east of Lund Street, and if you take a look at the three lots that are immediately behind 60 Lund Street, you'll see that they're all essentially 50 feet by 90 feet, 4,500 square feet. Our lot would be about 5,178 feet each. So our lots are not inconsistent with those lot sizes that are immediately above us. In the first handout that I gave you, I indicated that uh, there are letters of support um, from three of the immediate adjacent abutters. Two of those are the ones right behind on Dexter Street. The other is the uh, uh, family at 52 uh, Lund Street, which is to the immediate north and abutting. So we do think it's in the public interest to allow this type of subdivision on a lot that has sufficient frontage, good lot width, uh, short on depth we know, but um, uh, in a way consistent with the immediate abutting, abutting properties vis-a-vis -vis lot size. The second criteria is that the proposed use observe the spirit of the ordinance. Again, this, the ordinance enco encourages infill development, especially in these types of neighborhood which the land use code describes as being adjacent to the city core. Infill development doesn't demand new infrastructure other than utility tie-ins, but no new uh, significant improvements in terms of roads, things that the city has to maintain, uh, and the like. Interestingly, when these variances uh, are sought, you will see that there's still an adequate building envelope for each lot. Each lot can accommodate uh, the necessary setback requirements, which I think is pretty important from the perspective of uh, frontage. 
this lot, if you'll see when I make note of the large scale GIS blow up, this lot has more frontage than virtually every other lot on Dexter Street and in the immediate neighborhood. And therefore it has more lot width and it can accommodate two single family homes without need of setback variances from the side yards, for example, or the rear yard. So we can create building envelopes that work. Third criteria is that substantial justice be done. We again submit that substantial justice would be done to allow two lots in an infill development consistent with the goals of the land use code. Our Supreme Court notes that substantial justice is done when the public re realizes no appreciable gain from denying the variance, but the applicant's adversely affected in a material manner if it's denied. In this case, there's no gain to the public if the variance is denied. But if it's granted, there is a gain because there's a benefit achieved, implementation of infill development. Fourth criteria is the use be, that the proposed use not affect surrounding property values. I think the board has seen cases where property values aren't adversely affected when uh, an older um, single family home is upgraded, a new one is built nearby, uh, the neighborhood is benefited by that type of investment and vitality that's shown by someone interested in the property and then leading to uh, uh, good residential um, opportunities in the city. The last criteria, of course, is the hardship criteria. The board well knows the two-prong hardship test that must be achieved by an applicant. First is no fair and substantial relationship exists between the public purposes of the ordinance and the specific application of the ordinance to that property. And the second is that there used to be a reasonable use. This is all gauged on special conditions of the property. And I alluded to some already. We think the property has a number of special conditions. Again, it's in a relatively densely developed, long-standing, uh, in-town neighborhood. Immediately to its east off Dexter Street are homes with lot sizes smaller than those that we propose. If you could take a look, Mr. Chairman, of the, at that third handout, the large-scale GIS blow-up. That one there. It's, it's interesting, it struck me when I saw it the first time. When you, if you imagine driving down Lake Street, from Lake Street down Dexter Street, you'll see quite a number of relatively small lots. Um, and houses, generally speaking, positioned in the middle of those lots. You come towards, um, towards our property at 60 Lund Street, um, Still sm relatively smallish lot, but some start to get bigger, especially after you get past Cleveland Street, a bit bigger. But frontage-wise, this lot is about as big as any other, probably more so perhaps except for the one immediately next to it at 52 Lund. And our thought is that frontage is really the key factor when analyzing lots from across the street. The backyard and the depth aren't as large a factor, but frontage is. And if you have sufficient frontage, and we have more than uh, enough, we have 70, 150 feet divided by two, when only 50 feet divided by two is needed, excuse me, 100 feet divided by two is needed. So we have 150 feet for the two lots to be split into. You can get good separation from the homes that way, from the frontage, and you have that presentation on the street that we think works. So we've got an unusual frontage component on these lots. We also have a sort of constrained depth. And if you notice, between Lund Street and Dexter Street, the land mass is generally narrower than that laid out in the other blocks. And it kind of fixes the depth of these lots. Somewhat unique circumstance in this neighborhood generally. We're in the RB district as noted. And also as noted, the RB district uh, in the table of um, dimensional requirements contemplate uh, infill development in that type of district. So if you couple these special conditions with the goals of infill development, with the nature of this lot, with its frontage, with the fixed depth scenario, but with the ability to create adequate building envelopes, uh, we think that uh, these special conditions support the notion of finding the hardship. Again, the lots will meet the other dimensional requirements, as I've noted. If the variance is denied, of course, infill development's frustrated, not encouraged. 
So when we try to tie the purpose of the ordinance to the application of it here, the purpose of the ordinance is to promote, promote infill development, but it's frustrated in this case if it's not granted. But we think it's adequately uh, supported to be granted given these special conditions. The last requirement, of course, is that the use be a reasonable use. Only a single family home is proposed, not uh, anything more intense. Uh, obviously, that's a permitted use in the zone. It's common in the neighborhood, very common in the neighborhood, and hence we would think reasonable. The, if, if it, Mr. Chairman could note the letters of support that I indicated. There are One three minute. letters of support from the Butters. Uh, they're from 51 and 53 Dexter Street. Those are the two properties immediately behind 61 Street, uh, and I've annotated which ones they are on the, um, the, the Hainer Swanson plan, our initial exhibit. And the third letter of support is um, from 52 uh, Lund Street, which is immediately to the north of the property. These are all direct contiguous abutters in, in support. The last letter is that from Mr. Claremont. Um, he analyzed it from a sort of property value impact perspective. Again, he is a broker involved in this transaction, so full disclosure on that. Uh, but his, his experience is considerable in, uh, in the Nashville area for many, many years and expressed his thoughts. We very much appreciate your time, Mr. Chairman. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Oh. <clears throat> well, you got your 15 minutes just exactly right. <laughs> uh, any questions from the board? No? I, I, I will just observe that, um, Attorney Westgate, you, you repeatedly remarked about the uh, size of the lots on Dexter Street, but I note that the size of the lots on Lund Street in that immediate vicinity do tend to be uh, similar size to the existing lot. Um, so it would, it would be a little bit different, but that's uh, as it is. Uh, <clears throat> no other questions from the board? No? Okay, uh, you may have a seat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is there anybody in the room with, uh, who wishes to offer support for this application? Not seeing anybody. Is there anybody on Zoom who wishes to uh, register support for this application? No? Okay. Uh, as uh, Attorney Westgate said, uh, I do have some letters of support. The first one is from Wallace Burton of 51 Dexter Street. Uh, these three letters uh, have all the same wording. Um, dear members of the board, uh, Doug Dishard met with me regarding the property at 60 Lund Street. He explained that he and his business partner, David Bibbo, recently purchased 60 Lund Street. Doug explained that he and Mr. Bibbo have filed, filed an application with the Zoning Board of Adjustment for a variance to allow them to subdivide the property into two lots. Doug showed us the plan he submitted to the board. It shows that the two lots would be less than the 6,000 square foot requirement in the zone and also not deep enough per the requirements of the zone. We're very familiar with the property at 60 Lund Street and I'm quite aware of the poor condition of that property. We believe that subdivision of the property, construction of a new house on one of the lots and fixing up the existing house would be of great benefit to the neighborhood. We support their variance request. And a s identical letter is from Vic Vautier at 52 Lund Street and one from uh, I cannot read the name. Uh, somebody at 53 Lund Street. Uh, excuse me, 53, 53 Dexter Street. And then we also have uh, the letter that Attorney Westgate referenced from Rod Clermont um, that he says, I, I can emphatically say with the rehabilitation of the main home and building of a nice single family home on the extra lot, will directly enhance the neighborhood and indirectly increase the value of neighbor, neighboring homes. Uh, what exists now is a home garage and in-ground pool in poor condition. The garage is not suitable for anything and in the past has been used for storage for business uses. The pool will be removed and the garage demolished to make room for a new single family home. I support the variance application. So that's Rod Clermont of uh, 
no address is given on the letter. So I don't know where, where he's from, but uh, Attorney Westgate said that he's a broker involved in the, in the sale. But he works at Remax Innovative Properties somewhere. Okay, so then we also have, uh, yes, we have, okay. I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Okay. So is there anybody in the room who wishes to speak with questions, concerns, or opposition to the application? Not seeing any. Is there anybody on Zoom who wishes to speak with questions, concerns, or opposition to the application? Not seeing anybody. We do have some letters um, with questions, concerns, or opposition. Uh, there's a hand up now. Um, yeah. Oh, oh, there's a hand up. Okay, I see uh, Petra Ingram and and Susan Terrio. I do have a letter uh, from yes. Petra Ingram. So, we did. Oh, and from Susan Terrio. So, if if you wish to speak, uh, and then I just won't read your letter, then that would be fine. I'd rather read the letter. You well, it? we can. I have a couple of questions. Where does Rod Claremont live? Um. Well, all right. The Rob Claremont is a broker, and his address was not given on the letter that we received. Well, uh, supposedly he's not in our neighborhood then. No, no. He's he's he's, okay. he's actually involved in the transaction. Okay. But he's he's a real estate broker. Okay. Um, now, which, which would you prefer? Would you want me to read your um, letter? And I have another question about the infill that we've been hearing from the attorney. Sure. Um, is that intended for any type of housing, or is it intended for affordable housing in neighborhoods that people actually can afford? Or is it just to build any type of houses that can be sold for X amount of monies in the market today? I would assume 400 grand for a house in this neighborhood. Um, the, the concept of, of infill does not uh, try to qualify uh, based on, on cost. I mean, there are sometimes when there are new developments or uh, new apartment buildings, et cetera, being created, there is a requirement for affordable housing. But that, that, this is just a general uh, uh, preference of the city to. Uh, to infill large lots with with additional homes, but it, it's not a there, there's no regulation applied to it. Uh, okay, no, thank you for for clarifying that. Okay. I wasn't aware of that. We are zoned for infill. It, it's not a zoning thing. It's it's just a general desire. Of, you know, it, it's something that the the city encourages, but it's not not specific to a zone. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay. So you have uh, you sent a letter. Yeah. Want me to read the letter? Please. Thank okay. you. Okay. So this letter is from Petra and Kirk Ingram of 61 Lund Street. Uh, our main concern with allowing this variance to be granted is that it would set a precedent, which is we don't do precedents here. Sorry to comment on that. Um, other land house landowners on our street in our neighborhood would be able to subdivide their lots to sell to a builder or a flipper to build houses on lots that are considerably smaller than what our zoning laws in Nashua allow. We do need affordable housing in Nashua, but a flipper, as is the case with 61 Street, is only interested in getting the highest price possible for their investment property, which would eliminate the house on the proposed new lot to be part of an affordable housing option. We bought our house 24 years ago because it has a good sized lot. If this variance would be granted, we fear that this neighborhood will lose the character we all love and the green spaces it now has. Eventually, we would live on a street that has one house next to another and also increased traffic, and that would be similar to living in downtown Nashua. We pay a large amount of property taxes, and for that, we should be able to expect to maintain our current quality of life. Um, and you also have a, a comment about trash, but that's not relevant to us. Um, just a, a brief comment. Th there is no precedent served. Um, the, this board takes each case on its own merits, and uh, we don't look at uh, uh, necessarily what has been done in the past. Now, I also see that uh, Susan Terrio uh, sent a letter. Uh, is she there with you? Yes. Okay. Uh, would you like me to read your letter, ma'am? Please. Uh, okay. Let's see. 
I don't see your, oh, okay, here we go. This is from Michael and Susan Terrio, 65 Lund Street. Um, my husband and I have concerns with this property being sub, so I assume you mean subdivided, uh, because we fell in love with this neighborhood for the adequate space between the homes. We have lived here since 1997 and are directly across the street from this property. We have loved this family neighborhood in Homey Field. We didn't want to live in a neighborhood that houses were on top of each other. Our concerns are, uh, okay, so you, you are talking about the uh, discrepancy between uh, the proposed area and, and depth and the uh, ordinance, which is fine. Um, that's what we're here for is to uh, possibly grant a variance for that. Uh, this is quite different from the laws required for a quaint neighborhood. This could start a downward spiral so that everyone will want to sell or subdivide. We are concerned about the amount of extra noise, trash, traffic, and charm that will be lost. Trash, traffic, and charm that will be lost. We don't want to live on a street that houses are on top of each other. We have trusted the zoning laws would not allow people to subdivide just for financial gain. Please don't take this charm away from us. It would be so heartbreaking. Please consider the people who currently live here and that this will affect for years to come. Uh, there's something else here which is not relevant to this. Uh, thank you again and please for the love of our neighbors and neighborhood take all this into consideration. Okay, so this is again from Michael and Susan Terrio. Um, do you have anything that either of you wants to add to that? As you mentioned before, Mr. Lionel, um, the lawyer was referring to Dex properties on Dexter Street, but as you mentioned again, on our side of the street, which is the opposite side of the property, our property are larger and, um, what do you call it? Um, abide by the zoning laws that are currently in place. So they are actually That's larger. why we chose to live on this street versus Dexter Street, because the lots are bigger. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, I see that uh, Kelly Evans uh, has their hand up. Uh, you wish to speak with questions, concerns, or opposition? Kelly Evans, uh, if you, you... I had to unmute. <laughs> yeah, okay, and give your name and address for the record, please. My name is Kelly Evans, and I live at 59 Lund Street. I am directly across the street from this eyesore. <laughs> I understand it's in very poor shape, but where would these... I, I was driving, I could not see the map. Um, where would these driveways be going? Because I spent two years with the people across the street parking directly in front of my driveway, making it really difficult to get out, get around. Um, I too bought my property about eight years ago. I spent 15 years living on Blossom Street where the houses were on top of each other, postage size stamp, backyards, um, no availability for privacy. I spent a lot of money on buying the home. Um, I spend a lot of money on taxes to maintain the city. Um, you know, so I, I really have some concerns with all of a sudden us doubling up on our house down here. I live at the corner of Cleveland. So when you say Cleveland distal to um, Knoll Street, these are where the lots are getting got big. Okay, thank you. Um, we don't have a plan for how the um, for where driveways will be. That would some be something that goes into the planning board. Um, all we have is uh, we're looking at the, uh, the area and the lot depth uh, for subdivision. And the planning board would, would then uh, look at this again and uh, decide whether to grant subdivision. So it's, it's sort of a multi-step process. I understand, but you know, as the gentleman kept alluding to Nagel Street and Dexter Street, well, Nagel Street's got some bigger lots, but Dexter Street, yeah, they are on top of each other. They don't touch Lund Street. There's no way for you to get from Dexter Street to Lund Street, so I'm not sure where that fell into place, um, where that's relevant to what the property sizes are in this area. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Anything else? 
Nope. Thank you. Okay. So okay. please use the lower hand option to uh, lower your hand. Okay. Is there anybody else on, on Zoom with questions, concerns, or opposition? Can, can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, give your name and address for the record. Yes, Steve Narkunas at 64 Lund Street. Could you spell your last name, please, sir? Yeah, that would be N as in Nancy, A-R-K-U-N-A-S. Got it. Thank you. All right, you have five minutes. In general, uh, what I wanted to uh, reiterate is that, you know, a lot of the comparisons that have been done and that several of people have already mentioned is the fact that how houses are actually oriented on Dexter Street, you know, came to some uh, uh, understanding of how housing should uh, be relevant or okay to be produced on one street. And one street is, uh, has larger lots, uh, myself included, and uh, 59 One Street has a larger lot. On, on this side of the street, on the next, about half of One Street has larger lots. And all of a sudden, we're talking about having some kind of a um, condensation of... Uh, am I still on? Yes, yes, yeah. we can hear you. Okay, I heard a beep. I didn't know if that was my phone acting up on me or not. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, what is proposed is that you know, really just create a wrinkle in the uh, the entire uh, setup of, uh, of properties on on Lund Street because it's basically smack dab in the middle of the larger uh, lots, and it just seems atypical of the properties on Lund Street to all of a sudden create this wrinkle effect, this condensation of two houses on, on, on a single lot, so to speak. So that's my, my biggest concern. And even though it's part of the, uh, uh, my other concern is part of the planning board, you know, we're, we're talking about variance approvals and things of this nature, but certain logistics are, are required for people to understand exactly what is going to be placed on those properties if, if, if the variance was approved. You know, as far as driveways, you know, the, you know, the, the, the true setbacks. The site plan offered to me by the, uh, by the owner, uh, you know, just contains two rectangles on a piece of paper, which is completely <laughs> inadequate of, uh, of what is being proposed. So, you know, from a variant standpoint, that still does come into play to, to figure out what is actually going to end up on Lund Street in, in this particular area. Well, from the, the zoning board's perspective, sir, um, you know, if there were setback issues for the proposed construction, they would have to then apply for additional variances. Um, you know, but so we have to assume that whatever is planning to be constructed will uh, meet all of the setback requirements uh, in the ordinances. Because um, we, but, we but haven't- also there's, but, but also there's a placement of, uh, of certain things, uh, you know, primarily driveways, you know, the, you know, accessibility to the buildings, you know, what side of the buildings are they gonna be on? How are they going to uh, potentially interfere or interact with other properties? I mean, that, that is still uh, a logistical aspect of this that still plays a part in people's understanding of what is being proposed. Yeah, understand. That, that's, a, that's an issue for the planning board. The last thing that I'm worried about is that within the past year or so, the uh, Lump Street has actually gone through a significant uh, amount of uh, redress as far as gas lines, water lines, sewer, and things of that nature with the uh, the road in the past year being uh, you know fully paved over yeah and what are the implications now for a new dwelling uh being proposed on one street and having to tie into those utilities well um i don't i really can't comment on that that's that's not our purview i do know that nashua has a rule that after a, a street has been repaved it can't be torn up for five year, five years um, oh, then there you that's go. my under yeah. 
So. That's my understanding as well. So how is this even possible to uh, uh, to entertain a new structure on a street which has a five-year uh, moratorium? Uh, that's uh, that's that's their their concern, and they would have to clear that with the city elsewhere. But uh, the zoning board doesn't get involved in that, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Well, your, I, it, your, it's your nothing time, else. Your not, time is up, not, sir. Your time is up, sir. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Is there anybody else on Zoom with questions, concerns, or opposition? Not seeing anybody. Okay. Uh, Attorney Westgate, you have five minutes to speak to the concerns uh, that you heard tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, um, I, be I believe Mr. Claremont is on Zoom. And just for the record, if you could, I would ask him if he could state his residential business address so you have that, Mr. Chairman. That would be excellent. Uh, Mr. Claremont, would you take a moment and just give your, you could give your uh, business address. I, you're, mute you're still muted, sir. Mute, there we go. Um, my business address is 169 Daniel Webster Highway in South Nashua. Been at that location for some 10 years and have been working in the greater Nashua area for about 40, 45 years. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Clamor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if I could address a few of the points that um, neighbors raised. First, just to orient uh, ourselves, the, um, uh, Ms. Evans, has noted, is directly across uh, the street from what would be primarily the new lot. That is, she's mostly across from the pool, garage, and shed. But, of course, part of her lot is across from the lot which would house the new house as well. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Ingram are a uh, little further south of the, um, the where the new lot would be uh, across and then down a bit from the existing home. Mr. Narconis is adjacent to the existing home on the south side. And Ms. Ter Terrio is one uh, lot further down, I believe, from uh, Mr. and Mrs. Ingram. The, the point I was making regarding lot sizes and tying into Dexter Street essentially was this, Mr. Chairman. The, this lot has good frontage. It has 150 feet of frontage. It can be subdivided into two lots, each of which have 75 feet of frontage. From the lots across the street on Lund Street, the perspective is from the frontages of those two new lots, not so much the lot sizes in the rear yards. The presentation of the houses from the perspective of the other side of Lund Street is how the frontages lay out and how the side yard setbacks are, are met. And as the uh, chair noted, of course, we would have to meet those other dimensional requirements unless we sought other variances. So our thought is that we're not uh, out of order, if you will, with respect to lot size when facing uh, the Lund Street properties because of the nature of the frontages. It's also important to remember that this is an RB district. The minimum lot size is 6,000 feet. Some of the lots, as you head down Lund Street, are in the 10,000 square foot range. But many of the lots in the northern end of Lund Street, as you head towards Lake Street, are smaller than that. You can tell very easily from the GIS blow up. So it's not a uniform set of larger lots on Lund Street. Many of them are closer to the 6,000 square foot minimum than they are to the 10,000 square foot on some of the ones that are uh, towards the south end. The Dexter Street point I was making pertains to the rear yard. The people on Dexter Street are effectively the ones who are more affected by the request of variance because of the lot depth being shorter than the 80 square, the 80 lineal feet, and the lot size being 100, excuse me, 822 feet shorter. But none of the people on Dexter Street uh, have uh, concerns that have been raised tonight, and three, in fact, have provided, excuse me, two have provided support uh, by letter, and um, 52 Lund Street has also provided uh, support by letter. So that's a perspective I was noting. Not looking at Lund Street in a vacuum, or Dexter Street in a vacuum, but taking the notion of how you perceive each house, each property, from Lund Street across the street, noting frontage and being able to split that frontage, and Dexter Street from the rear 
and understanding the impact of the variances on those lot lines and excuse me, lot sizes and lot depths. Uh, as, as you noted, Mr. Chairman, of course, this board doesn't set precedent. Um, each case is unique. Um, it's also, I think, important to note that the properties on Lund Street are also unique. If you look at that GIS map blow up, you'll see that many, most of the properties have their homes centered uh, on the lots, generally centered on lots, and don't have 150 feet of frontage. Uh, therefore, they wouldn't have logically sufficient lot width or frontage in most cases to accommodate an existing house and create another lot. It just wouldn't work out because of the nature of those. So I, I don't think a cascading effect is uh, contemplated by uh, what we've requested. Um, of course, there has to be some engineering, full engineering done if we're fortunate enough to be able to go to the planning board. Uh, all, of, all the butters would have the opportunity to comment on that engineering, could involve comments on driveway locations and the like. Nothing's wedded to uh, any of that at this point. Um, but those are uh, elements of the planning board discussion. Okay, you have 30 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We appreciate okay. your time. Thanks. Okay, uh, so we have one and only one of the people with questions, concerns, or opposition uh, can have five minutes to speak. Um, I see uh, Petra Ingram and Susan Terrio still have their hand up. Uh, you want to, if you want to volunteer to be that. Uh, person with, uh, who responds to what Attorney Westgate just said, uh, you may do so, uh, you don't have to. Um, we have a, he had the address of Susan Terrier wrong. The numbers here on Lund Street are somewhat not in order. They haven't been for many years. So Susan lives right across from the property, actually. 65 is exactly across from 60. Yeah, at that property and I would also like to mention that um, our quality would be just as impacted by another building in this neighborhood and driveways and more traffic as Mr. Patel's driveway was in their neighborhood I think and so I just wanted to draw that um, comparison thank you okay. on Cherry yeah all right, anything else? Anything else? Okay, thank I you. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wait, there's one more thing. Oh. My husband. My husband. Oh, yeah, oh. he was just saying that the numbers are not in order. They go 59, 65, 61, 63. Yeah. Just we, the we, record. We, we do have that on, on, the, uh, on the city map. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. Thank you. So at this point, I will close the public hearing and open the public meeting. Mr. Courier, do you have any comments? Well, uh, you know, I, I hear the abutters point loud and clear, like there's a couple of lots here that are larger. I've spent time looking up and down Lund Street. I mean, I, I, I do feel that as you head up towards Lake Street, it, it's pretty clear that they're much smaller lots. I mean, I, I don't think that end of Lund Street is approaching how dense and tight it feels on Blossom Street. Uh, but I, I, I guess, uh, you know, I, I, I'm struggling a bit. Uh, certainly, this lot we're talking about, the one to the north and south, are are a bit bigger and give a little more open feel to Lund Street, but I do find that most of the properties on Lund are much more around 6,000 square feet. So uh, I guess I'm on the fence and looking uh, to hear three other opinions to help me out. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mancara. Uh, I'm a bit on the, the fence as well. Um, I, I do accept the argument related to frontage in that the perception of density um, would not really be inconsistent with what you see overall in the neighborhood given that um, the, the frontage is so substantial and the depth issue and the size of the lots would be not quite as perceptible 
Um, you know, so, so I, I lean to support in that way. Also, the existing dwelling is located toward one side, so another lot could, another home could be built on this lot without seeming to be out of place. The depth is the depth. Um, that's simply what exists, so that wouldn't change. Um, and, and, and the fact that we do have support from uh, the, the two properties on Dexter that would be most impacted by the new home, um, I, I, I think is significant. Um, that said, uh, one additional lot does make a difference. Uh, it's not a huge difference, but it's a difference. Um, we, we do need info. Uh, I, I would also add that. Um, I was a little disappointed not to hear some response to the concern of the driveway um, f uh, that was uh, conveyed by 59. I, I, I appreciate that we're not asked to look at the driveway and that that's something that the planning board may do. However, um, this existing lot as it stands now is entitled to 24 feet of driveway. Uh, two lots, double that. So I, I, I think the addition of another driveway in a location is something that is relevant to somebody who lives directly across the street in particular. And so I was a bit disappointed that there was no response to that because I would have to think that a driveway location and a house location is contemplated, even if it isn't uh, set in stone. So um, I guess I would say I'm leaning towards supporting the ap application, um, but not without some discomfort and, and would certainly be interested to hear what my, my colleagues have to say. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Boucher. Uh, I'm, I'm in support of the application, um, specifically because Again, I, I believe that um, that that the homes that are being the the extra, the extra home that's being proposed and the home that exists um, again meets all the uh, setback requirements. Um, you know, this was brought up in discussion about uh, one of the um, one of the uh, people who spoke uh, had talked about houses being on top of houses, and and certainly. Um, you know, we can maybe, um, some of us could look at that and, and glean that from, you know, the Dexter Street, uh, what's right behind. Um, and, and obviously, I think that can certainly exist uh, all the way up the street. And some homes, because the lots are so shallow, um, they exist uh, so close to the street. So, so in that respect, um, I, you know, again, it's not what it is, but if these lots, if this house had the this, this sufficient depth, then there could be three new homes. There could be three homes on this 150 feet, correct? Because we're, we're looking at 50 feet minimum frontage. So um, I think that that the extra 25 feet, as, as much as it may not seem like a lot, I, I think really goes to the point of uh, really um, giving it, again, as, as, um, as the applicant spoke, the, the look of uh, more spread out um, than that thing. I I know that driveways are an issue. Um, I, I was thinking the same thing about the 24 foot wide driveway, um, and you know, depending on what street you live in, we, in the different parts of the city that have wider streets or not, I, I think it's just something um, that, unfortunately, for some, you know, it's just something that you have to that people live with. Um, and it's the ordinance, right? It's what's allowed. So, um, but I, I also believe that, again, not, not it would be nice, because we, we get applications that have homes with the layout in the driveway and we have a better picture of it. Um, but I do believe that the planning board is um, going to do its job and uh, consider all those comments about um, the layout in, in the driveways. Um, so, so, I guess with that, um, and the other thing too is, um, having gone by the property, um, having lived in the neighborhood near there, having walked this, these streets, um, and up and down these streets, uh, you know, I, I, I haven't gone by this house again for this application. I, I recognize the house, and I, I can't believe that. I have to believe that anything that gets done there is going to be a huge improvement for that neighborhood. So, for those reasons, I'm going to support the application. 
Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and I, I share some of the concerns of my colleagues uh, regarding uh, making two smaller lots out of this one large lot compared to the, the lots that are near it on Lund Street. Um, but uh, it, what's being proposed doesn't seem unreasonable to me. Um, uh, and I, I know, you know nobody likes uh, having extra houses built near them, um, but this is happening all over. Uh, I, can't, I can't think of something that would cause me to vote against this, um, but it, I'm not enthusiastic <laughs> about it. So uh, I am sort of cautiously in support of it. Uh, any other comments from the board before we proceed? Uh, okay, uh, would somebody care to make a motion? I'll make a motion. Mr. Boucher, thank you. I'd like to make a motion for Douglas Dishard and David Bebo, owners of 60 Lund Street, Sheet 102, Lot 216, requesting, okay, the following, good. requesting the following variances from Land Use Code Section 190-16, Table 16-3. One, from, from New Lot 216, minimum lot area 6,000 square feet required, 5,178 square feet proposed. Two, from minimum lot depth 80 feet required, 71 feet proposed. Three, from new lot 216-1, minimum lot area 6,000 square feet required, 5,178 square feet proposed. And four, minimum lot depth 80 feet required, 67 feet proposed. All requests to subdivide one lot into two lots, existing house to remain on lot, and construct one new single family house in the RB zone, Ward 6. We find that the variance is needed to enable the applicants to propose use of the property given the special conditions of the property. Um, again, um, this is, um, uh, property uh, that exists uh, down in this section of, of, of uh, Lund and Dexter, this strip of land in between, um, there are some short depth lots. Um, it's an existing condition. Um, and we find that the benefit sought by the applicant cannot be achieved by some other method reasonably feasible other than the applicant to pursue than the variance. Uh, we find that it is within the spirit and intent of the ordinance. We find that it will not adversely affect property values of surrounding parcels. We find that it's not contrary to public interest, and we find that substantial justice will be served. So with that, I make a motion to approve the area of variance. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Mancara, thank you for your second. Any discussion of the motion? Ready to vote? Mr. Courier, how do you vote? Uh, Mr. Courier votes in denial of the motion. Mr. Boucher, how do you vote? Mr. Boucher votes in favor. Mr. Mincara, how do you vote? Mr. Mincara votes in favor. And I, Mr. Lionel, vote in favor. That's three to one. Um, that does meet the criteria, and so the variances have passed. Um, please be aware there's a 30 day window of appeal. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Uh, uh, yeah. Contact, Ed, there's no more discussion from the public, sorry. Um, uh, there's a 30-day window of appeal, contact the planning department. Anybody can appeal, uh, ask for a rehearing, and um, contact the planning department for any more information on that. So we will continue on to case nine. Owner is John Lahoulier, 601A Penichuk Street, Sheet 49, Lot 48, requesting the following. Variance from Land Use Code Section 190-16, Table 16-3, for minimum lot area 10,000 square feet existing, 21,780 square feet required, and two, special exception from Land Use Code Section 190-15, Table 15-1, uh, number six, to convert 61A Penichuk Street from a single family dwelling to a two family dwelling for a total of three dwelling units on the property. This is in the RA Zone Ward 3. Uh, good evening, please give your name and address for the record. John Lahoulier, 61A Penichuk Street, Nashville, New Hampshire, 03064. Okay, uh, you have 15 minutes and walk us through what you'd like to do. 
when I first bought the property, um, there were two lots, and I was going to build the duplex in the middle of the lot, but we discovered a sore pipe in the middle, so the city and I came up with a detached duplex shared driveway. Um, I'd like to finish my basement, and in order to have a win-win-win situation, um, the best solution was to come up with this variance and special exception. Um, there's no outside changes, there's no additional parking, no additional people. Uh, it's basically finishing my basement. And I'm, that's all I have to say. Is that it? Yes. Any questions from the board? Uh, Mr. Mancara. I, I guess I'm not understanding something. You're creating another apartment. Be a, a, You're not finishing your basement for. Your it would be a, a, a second. Uh, what you said about the dwelling unit. Accessory so, dwelling unit? Yeah, that accessory dwelling unit. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, no. It's a, it would be a duplex. So 60, right now, 61A and 61B. Those are very different. Mr. Falk, can you help us here? It's our understanding that um, 61B will remain a single family home and 61A would have the unit up above and a, another unit down below for two units, but not so an accessory dwelling not unit. Accessory that's a different, dwelling unit that's is a different very set of different. criteria and different application. Well, so I, it's a variance I, for the land area and especially I wanted a duplex project. that was. Yeah, that's what's proposed. That's, that's what what's proposed. proposed. It was advertised correctly. I, I should not have said accessory dwelling unit. Please strike that. Yeah. Back. <laughs> that's going to cause okay. confusion. So the, exist. a duplex would have its own entrance uh, and, and separate from the rest of the house. We have two stairways. When I originally came with the plans to the city, I expressed interest in finishing the basement. And Carter was here at the time, and um, the city were suggested that I had two legal means of egress, so I do have two legal means of egress. So from the garage, there's a separate entrance to the lower level. Okay. And there's a second that goes to the laundry, the shared laundry. So you're going to you're going to take your basement, finish it, and and construct a second independent apartment. Correct. And I have letters from all of the abutters and support. Yes, I I do see letters from abutters. Um, any questions from the board for it's the also applicant? Dead end street. I'm not sure if you're sure. Mr. Curry has a hand up. Uh, Mr. Currier. Yeah, I, I, I guess it's really a question for Mr. Falk, but I'd like him to address it while the applicant has a chance to speak to it as well. But first to Mr. Falk is, just to make sure I have it right, that 10,000 square feet is what's existing for 61A and 61B. Do I have that right? That's correct. Okay. Um, so I guess that my, that my question to the applicant is, I, I mean, I, I, when I saw this and took a look, I, I, my initial reaction was kind of struggling with the, the request where more than twice the square footage is not present to support, uh, you know, a, really a total of three families. And I was just uh, trying to help me out with understanding, uh, you know, the, the need or ha how this came up. I, I, the uniqueness of the property or something to help me out with the need for this. Why I need the variance and the special exception? Well, wh why, well why, why the subdivide C1A? I mean, is there, I guess perhaps I'm assuming maybe it's just for income, you have have a unit there you can rent out, or is there yeah, some that's, unique? That's the intent. Yes. Okay. All right. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think I'm all set. Mr. Mankara. 
So this is a two unit condominium development, correct? It's a detached duplex. They're separate buildings. On Just a shared driveway. Lots. The only reason it's a condominium is because of the shared driveway. Yeah, they are on two separate lots, sort of. Well, they were originally two separate lots. The city required that we condense them to one lot in order to get the approval for the detached duplex because of the sewer line. That, that was the hardship, was the sewer line in the middle of the property. Right. So these are two condominium units on one lot right now? Yes. Yes. So would this be a third condominium? Yes. You, so you'd be expanding the condominium to be three condominium units? Yes. Uh, well, no, I'm not sure that's correct because the, I mean, who owns the, who's going to own the, the basement apartment? Who's going to actually own it? Is it rented or, is it, or, or are they going to own it? I will be the owner of both of the units. Okay, so it is not in condominium ownership. He's, he's creating an apartment that he's going to rent Right. I'm just wondering whether or not that's something that the condominium allows and contemplates because usually a condominium has restrictions on the further subdivision of units within it. There's no restrictions. I have, I can get a copy, but the recorded, the condominium documents are recorded. You right. You can get a copy, but there are no restrictions. I, I was integral part of the condominium documents. <laughs> Mr. Chair, yes. well, it's the RA zone requires 7,260 square feet of land per unit. So with three separate dwelling units, even though Mr. LaHulier would, would own two of them, it's still the 7,260 square feet of land required per unit. So that's why we had it advertised at 71,000 21,000 yeah. Yeah, I, I understand required. I understand that I, I mean mr. Mancara raised an interesting question about uh, that you know whether this is a third condominium unit which it is not but it is an apartment within one of the condominium units I mean, it doesn't really have anything to do with our zoning code that's really a whether it's a financing or ownership issue does the, does the planning department have to get involved in this? No, we don't get involved with ownership like that. Same thing with, with we, like that Condex unit we had a couple of meetings ago. Um, yeah, it was on Pine Street. That one, we didn't get involved with the, the Condex. That's usually a, a private matter that someone can take care of with the state attorney general's office. But it's not really a requirement that are we don't have an application for a condex or a condo type of ownership like that yeah so he would have to work it out on a you know with his attorney and I, I thought of that I, I thought of the next step I, I'm always thinking the next step and I thought I obviously want the approval and I thought what if then I I do have to go to legal counsel next yeah to because there were a lot of questions on been in real estate since I'm 16 years old. So I have a lot of the same questions that I'm sure you have. But those are not pertinent to this. To the zoning code, right. They're, they're issues that I have to deal with after, if, uh, hoping I get the approval. And I think if there is a condominium agreement or some legal uh, documents that are recorded, you know, they, those may need to be amended, but that's a, a private legal matter that Mr. LaHulier would have to take care of. It wouldn't be part of what our staff would do. Yeah. Okay. Um, any further questions from the board? So, so basically, what I'm getting is we're not, by making whatever decision we make, if we're to, if we're to prove we're not violating, we're not going against something, some type of uh, legal no, no, we're, we're just enabling him to proceed with his intention, but... And, and, and I, also, I also understand that this would not be called a condominium if not for uh, the, the, the sewer line pump, the area in between, this would have been, this would have been a duplex if it wasn't for um, not being able to build pretty much over the middle of that lot. Well, it would have been two single-family homes, not a duplex. 
would have been. Yeah, because we had the option of doing they're either. They're okay. separate. All right. Okay. At the Check time, until we found the source. All right. I have one other question. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, just could you clarify, the applicant could clarify the parking situation for 61A and B? How many parking spots off the street are there? The, the, there are two, each unit, 61A has two car attached garage, 61B has two car attached garage, both at the back of the building and there are additional parking spaces as well. There's crushed stone for 61A and all of the crushed stone area is limited common areas used for parking for either unit and there are additional asphalt parking and um, depending on, on semantics, um, the stone dust could be considered crushed stone and that would be also additional parking. So there are nine plus parking if you count all of them. And, and where's the crushed stone and stone dust? Uh, I mean, I took a look at the site, but I, I, I don't recall the, that. The crushed stone are the area behind the garage and there's a cement pad and um, stone dust on 61B. Okay, thanks. Further questions from the board? The backyard is probably the best answer. The backyard of each of the units. Okay, not seeing any questions from the board uh, more. Uh, you may have a seat. Thank you. Okay, I see nobody in the audience. And I see no member of the public uh, on Zoom. I do see Matt Sullivan has joined us on Zoom. So um, I guess I can't, I have uh, letters of support. Uh, we have one from Alan Phillips of 61B uh, Penachuk Street. Uh, it says, I'm aware that John LaHoulier is owner of 61A is requesting a variance and a special exception to turn his basement into another unit, making 61A into a duplex, and I fully authorize and support his request. I uh, have another letter from Tyler Burns of 58 Penachuk Street, who says the same thing, and one from Greta Petty of 56 Penachuk Street, uh, who says the same thing. And they are, all three of those are in support and I have seen no letter in opposition. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to close the public hearing and open the public meeting. Uh, Mr. Courier, your comments. Well, I, I, uh, I, I gotta say I'm struggling with the overage request of, you know, with the 10,000 square feet. Uh, I mean, I, I, I guess I'm feeling that there's there's, there's a want on behalf of the owner to do this. I, you know, I'm assuming it's, it would be some good income. I, I, uh, there's a need for housing in Nashua, but I'm, this is more than twice the request. And I, 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 I I'm not seeing something unique in the property i mean i know there's a sewer easement on it so there's two separate buildings i i see how that's developed but i think there's fine use of the property in the in, in its current state and i'm struggling for one of my board members to help me get around to see how this is a prudent request i'm not there with it at this time thank you mr mincara I, I think I'm in the same place as Mr. Courier. I, I'm struggling to find um, anything, uh, uh, you know, any special condition of the property that would warrant it. The the overage is huge. Um, you know, there's two existing dwelling units there now. Um, in, in looking at the neighborhood, and maybe I missed something, but I, I, I didn't notice that a single family home was out of place in any way the, I, I couldn't find any other duplexes or multifamily in the immediate area again maybe I missed something but it wasn't as though this property is somehow out of character and I heard no arguments at all as to um, 
you know, why the variance would be warranted other than a desire for additional income. So I, I, I'm not finding support for the application. Um, let's see, Mr. Boucher. Uh, I'm also having a hard time with this one. Um, I, I, I know that, um, you know, the lot would support the, the extra unit. Um, I mean, the parking, I guess, would not be an issue as testified by the applicant. Um, but I'm still trying to see, again, as, as uh, stated before, what the special condition of the property is to, to have this. I mean, besides, again, it's great that, you know, any way we can generate income these days is, is a great thing. Um, and again, uh, you know, I'm always trying to see from the applicant's point of view, you know, what we're trying to do. Uh, I'm just trying to, I just don't, I guess I'm, I, I, I'm lost at this one and I, I'm not seeing it. And I know I'm not probably describing it as how I feel. It's just that this one really is, is, is tough for me. Um, but I think I'll, I'll just stand with right now, I'm, I'm falling more on the side of, uh, of I just can't see enough of a special condition to for me to support the application as it stands right now. Thank you. Um, this is really, really kind of weird. I mean, I, I also do not support the application as presented. If uh, Mr. LaHoulier had presented this as an ADU, that would, <laughs> there would be very little that we could say about it. And, and, and it's almost like the, exactly what he's trying to do, except that he would have to fulfill the special regulations of the ADU. Um, but as um, to convert it in, into a, a two-family dwelling, I can't support that. There are no special conditions of the property. Uh, he just wants to create a rental apartment. And uh, unfortunately, one can do that with an ADU. I wish that weren't the case, but it currently is. Um, so um, I'm not in support of the application as presented here for either the area variance or the special exception. Um, any further discussion? All right. Uh, somebody care to make a motion? Uh, I'll make the motion. Mr. Boucher, thank you. I'd like to make a motion uh, to deny the area variance for John LaHoulier, owner of 61A Penachuck Street, sheet 49, lot 48, requesting the following. Variance on land use code section 19-16, table 16-3, for a minimum lot area of 10,000 square feet existing, 21,780 square feet required, and two, special exception from land use code section 19-15, table 15-1, number six, to convert 61A Penichuck Street from a single family dwelling to a. To Mr. Boucher, I think we um, need yeah, separate I'm motions. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, Yes. So we're just going to take the uh, first area variance. So we find that the variance is not needed to enable applicants to use the property, given that we don't find any special conditions of the property, and the benefits sought by the applicant um, uh, it could be achieved by some other method uh, reasonably feasible for the applicant to pursue other than the variance. We find that it's not within the spirit and intent of the ordinance. We find that it would would have made, would have would not adversely affect property values on the parcels, but at this point, that's not the main um, crux of the um, denial. And we find that um, it would be contrary to public interest at this time, and we find that um, substantial justice uh, would not be served. So again, I make a motion to deny the area of variance. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. McCarr. Uh Mr. Courier, how do you vote? Mr. Courier votes in favor of the denial. Mr. Mincara, how do you vote? Mr. Mincara votes in favor of the denial. Mr. Boucher, how do you vote? Mr. Boucher votes in favor of the denial. And Mr. Lionel votes in favor of the den denial. Uh, that's uh, four to nothing denying the area variance. Uh, now, would you do the special exception, please? Okay, so um, trying to figure out how we're going to handle this. Or Just, what, what, you can make a motion to deny it. Um, okay. So I'm not going to really go through any of this because it's not really applicable, right? Um, 
I well, mean, we I, have the application. We need to we need to yeah. go through the motions. What, what I'm saying is, I don't know how I would convert, convert go through the, the conditions. Of, yeah, all these. Well, the, the special exception uh, has its own. Well, that's what I'm saying. Oh, how do I well, I mean, you you can you can say that. Um, I would just to deny it because it you know the, the, because the variance has been denied. Really, it's moved. But okay, all right. Just make so a motion to deny. Okay. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to uh, deny the special exception for John LaHoulier, owner of 61A Penichuk Street, Sheet 49, Lot 48, requesting the, the following special exception from land use code section 190-15, table 15-1, number six, convert 61A Penichuk Street from a single family dwelling unit to a two family dwelling unit for a total of three dwelling units on the properties in the area zone, Ward 3. Um, again, the area variance was uh, denied. So um, I believe at this point um, that the special exception is, is moot. Got it. Is that adequate? No, I, I, I think don't think so. All no. five. I would go. Yeah, we have it, to go through. We have it, to. It's, um, it's. We have to. We have to go through the, the, the five. I mean, to be honest, we could. Theoretically, grant the special exception, but the area variance was denied. But I, it's kind of silly. But if you look at the five points of law, um, I mean, a special except well, multifamily is in the table of uses. Um, you know, for one thing, it is listed in the table of uses. But you know, the the board will have to go through the other the remaining four points of law. It's just better to be more thorough and go over each of the points of yeah. law instead of just not going over them you know while the while the public hearing has just been concluded all right so if, if there's any discussion and i'll be more than happy to amend the motion if somebody feels that they would amend. so um so it is so to continue on it is listed in the table of uses um i it will, it will not create undue traffic congestion or unduly impair pedestrian safe, safety. It would not overload public water, drainage, sewer, or other municipal systems. Um, the special regulations are not fulfilled. Well, um, we don't have any special regulations. Yeah, right, that's right. Um, there are no special regulations to fulfill. Um, we find that it could be, it could, um, it could impair the integrity or be out of character with the neighborhood or be detrimental to the health walls of welfare as the residents. So it will it will be we find that it would be it would impair integrity or be out of the character of the neighborhood or be detrimental to health morals or welfare of the residents. So with that I make a motion to deny a special exception. Second. Okay. Discussion of the motion. Mr. Currier, how do you vote? Mr. Currier votes in favor of the denial. Mr. Boucher, how do you vote? Mr. Boucher votes in favor of the denial. Mr. Mincara, how do you vote? Mr. Mincara votes in favor of the denial. And I, and Mr. Lano, vote in favor of the denial. Okay, so the special exception is denied. Um, you have, and I'm sorry that uh, we did not grant your variance or special exception. You have 30 days to appeal. You may want to consider refiling this as an ADU request. Um, we, and we could hear that, but talk to uh, the planning department if you have questions. Uh, no, I, no. Thank you. I, I'm going to have to sell my house. No. You don't. Can't please everybody. Okay. Um, so we are now, we have no rehearing requests. Um, we do have an agenda for next time to dig mine out. Um, so let's see, that's not that one. Find it. Does anybody see any regional impact from the uh, agenda? I just got uh, a question for Mr. Falk on the regional impact. Is this abutting the Dunstable Land Trust? And the wetland, I didn't know if yes. that might be something that they should be notified. Thoughts on that, Mr. Falk? Um, 
What? I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Curry. What case was what was the address on that one? Uh, on Broughton. Yeah, we, Broughton would, we would notify them. The Dunstable Land Trust in the town of Dunstable. Yeah, okay, because it's right on the border right. with them, and, and that wetland is shared with them. Yeah, we would notify them. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else see any regional impact? No. Uh, Mr. Boucher says no. Mr. McCara? No. No. And I do not. And Mr. Courier has noted possible regional impact, so that's been noted. We have minutes from July 12th. Has everybody had a chance to review the minutes? And does anybody see the need for any corrections? Not seeing any, so uh, I have a motion to approve the minutes. Mr. Boucher, thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mancara. Uh, Mr. Courier, how do you vote? Mr. Courier votes uh, in favor of uh, the approval of the minutes. Mr. Boucher, how do you vote? Mr. Boucher votes in favor. Mr. Mancara, how do you vote? Mr. Mancara votes in favor. And I, Mr. Lionel, vote in favor. I have one question, uh, I, just for the attendance. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, could you let us know when you joined? I'd like to put that on the staff attendance. Yes, absolutely. I joined at approximately 8.15 p.m. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. Motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Okay. We are adjourned at 9.53 p.m.